Good morning, everyone. Good morning, good morning. Hello, hello, hello. Hello. Hi. My name is Jonathan Strauss. I'm the acting manager of the Future Students Office here at UNSW. We would like to welcome you to UNSW. It's lovely to see so many familiar faces. I hope to be able to catch up with many of you over morning tea and the little tiny break in the middle and then at lunch this afternoon as well. Um, a couple of things before we get started. Um, first things first, bathrooms. For those of you who do not know, just exit straight out the way you came in and turn left as soon as you get down the stairs. Um, there are facilities there. And then morning tea will be held upstairs, back where you registered. So we're making sure that everyone's getting fit today by going up and down the stairs a couple of times. Um, and then the break, there will be that short little break just in case you need to move around a little bit before we get our last few presentations in before lunch. Then lunch will be from about 1.10, 1 o'clock um, in Leighton Hall, which is just upstairs and behind registration. And that's where we will gather for lunch. And it is open seating, so you will be able to sit wherever you'd like. There are about 30 staff from the university attending as well, so if you could be so kind as to leave a single seat at your table for a UNSW staff person to hopefully entertain you with amusing stories and interesting stories, uh, that would be wonderful. Um, and without further ado, just a couple of other housekeeping things before we go. You're welcome to take photos of the slides if you'd like with your iPads, iPhones, whatever else you have. Um, we will make the presentation available on um, the UNSW Future Students website so that you can download those presentations. And we'll also hopefully have video of today's event as well that you can download later. So without further ado, I would like to welcome up our brand new um, President and Vice Chancellor, uh, Professor Ian Jacobs, um, who is here to welcome you, but also give you a little bit of share his vision for the university and a couple of other things as well. So please join me in welcoming Professor Jacobs. Thanks, everyone. It's, it's great to be here. Um, I'm in my fourth week at UNSW. I noticed that it's set out here like being back at school. Everyone's sitting towards the back. No one's prepared to sit in the front rows. Um, so it's... Uh... But a warm welcome to all of you. Um, it, it really is a pleasure to welcome you to UNSW today. Since starting my post as President and Vice-Chancellor of what is a truly great university just over three weeks ago, I've been enjoying the buzz of meeting new people, hearing their ideas, finding my way around this superb campus, and joining what is an outstanding community of students, scholars, and professional support staff assembled from around the globe. And I'm really pleased that this event coincides with my start at UNSW, and gives me an, an opportunity to speak with you because I am passionate about ensuring that we enroll students of ability at UNSW and that talented students from all backgrounds can secure the benefits of the sort of high quality degree that UNSW can provide. And as you'll know, a high quality education is exactly what this university can provide. UNSW is one of the world's top 100 universities, top 100 of over 30,000 worldwide, so that's quite some achievement. Particularly a great achievement for a university which was formally created just 66 years ago, although of course the, the, the roots of this university go back to the 19th century. And that ranking that's been achieved now is based on some stellar achievements. In research terms, the stats that people here can roll out are truly impressive. In 2014, UNSW was first in Australia for competitive research funding from NHMRC and first from the Australian Research Council, first for industry-linked research grants and first for volume of research publications. UNSW's success in research is built upon equally outstanding teaching and education across the full range of topics. Um, and, and of course, the, the roots of this university were in success in science and technology, but the, the, the breadth is now much greater than that. And the, we cover the full range of topics from arts, social sciences, built environment and design, through business and law, to engineering, science and medicine. 
The quality of education is reflected in what the alumni of our university go on to achieve through their academic contribution and through practical application. And when I started to find out about UNSW on my way here and since I've arrived, I was fascinated to discover that UNSW is first in Australia for the number of chief executives running top 100 companies. And, and this is for those who are interested in financial reward, it's first in Australia for the number of alumni who have become millionaires, 33rd in the world by that score. But you know, from my point of view, more importantly, they stand alongside brilliant scientists, creative geniuses whose ideas and discoveries really have changed the lives of people around the world. And at UNSW, we place a particular emphasis on optimizing the student experience. And as you'll see as you walk around the campus at UNSW, it's a vibrant campus with exceptional facilities for study and for recreation. It's O week now, and if you walk around, as you may have done today, uh, you'll, you'll sense the, the welcome our new students are, are receiving and the buzz and excitement around campus. I'm confident that our students have high quality accom accommodation readily available to them. They have recreational opportunities in the form of clubs and societies to appeal to every interest. And they have a wide range of choices for things like um, food and, and other things they need on campus. You'll be hearing from my colleagues from across the university during the rest of today. And I'm confident that you'll be left with a sense of assurance that everything our staff do at UNSW is designed to provide a top quality higher education with exciting opportunities for study and recreation in a safe, considered environment. And we share the wish that I know you will all have, that students who come here should have a happy, fulfilling time at UNSW and go on from here, well equipped for a rounded, successful life and, and career. Before I finish, there is one thorny topic that I know will be of concern for your students and families and, and for yourselves that I can't avoid mentioning. I wish that we were in a position to provide you with clarity on the schedule of fees that we'll charge from 2016. In fact, when I signed up for this job, they promised me that by, by December last year, tuition fees would all be sorted. Sadly, that's not the case. And it's a frustration. And unfortunately, given the impasse in Senate and the resultant uncertainty, I can't give you that clarity. I can, however, assure you of a couple of things. First of all, that if fees are deregulated, we will be taking a highly responsible approach to tuition fees and we'll strike the right balance between providing, between charging fees that enable us to provide a top quality education whilst not unfairly burdening our students so that they end up with ridiculous levels of debt in the future. And the second is that, as I said to you earlier, we have an absolute commitment to enrolling the most talented students regardless of background, regardless of gender, ethnic group, indigenous, indigenous origin, and socioeconomic background. That is an absolute commitment. You don't really need me to tell you what difference higher education at a university like UNSW can make to your students' lives. Securing a place at a university like UNSW will help them achieve and acquire a superb foundation for their future lives and careers. It opens the door to study at the highest level, to meeting talented people from many, many different backgrounds, to new ideas and activities, to exciting career opportunities, and of course, importantly, if you're coming to university, to having fun. And I hope that we'll also imbue them with a really strong sense of the responsibility to society that goes with acquiring a university education of this quality. A responsibility to use the opportunities they have to try in everything they do whilst they're at university and once they leave university through their careers and through their lives to make a difference to the lives of others. I've deliberately kept this introductory message relatively short because I do want to take questions from you and, and, and perhaps start a dialogue, which I know will continue during the, during the day. 
It's been a pleasure and a privilege to have this opportunity to, to start the day with a few words, and I hope that you enjoy the rest of this seminar. I know that our team of staff from across the university will be pleased to answer any questions you have about uh, UNSW education. I also realize that you have a key role in helping your students make life-changing decisions. Actually, you have a key role beyond what the students really realize at the time, but the advice you give them will, of course, be something that they look back on as really important in influencing their lives and careers. And our staff at UNSW will be pleased to help in any way that we can in, in ensuring you have the information you need to give that advice. So thanks very much for listening, and the floor is now open for discussion and questions. Thank you. I think it's okay. We do have time. I yeah, think. absolutely. Um, Does anyone have any questions for Ian? Far away. Mr. Baird, where would you come from? Okay. <laughs> yeah. So I was going to start by saying something about myself, but um, I'm glad you've given me that opportunity. <laughs> so um, I, I grew up in London, North London. I, um, and, and, and what I'm going to say is actually relevant to this. I, um, my, my parents were immigrants to the UK. I'm, I'm a s second stroke, third generation immigrant. They arrived from Poland and Russia, not speaking English. Education was important to them, but I was the first person in my family to have the chance for a university education. Um, and actually, I had the benefit in the UK at the time that there were things called direct grant schools, so you, I got into a good school. My parents only had to pay according to their income. And I then went to Cambridge University as a result of that, not having to pay any fees. And I then went on to medical school. Um, I trained in, in women's health, so I'm a specialist in women's health. I became a cancer surgeon in women's health. It was um, cancer surgery and the clinical work around that and the research I did around that, and I still have a big research program, that led me into leadership. I had the privilege of leading big research groups and then became dean of medicine at University College London. From that, I became vice president and dean at the University of Manchester, and it's Manchester I've come from. And just to finish off on that... Um, I spent most of my career in London and Cambridge. I did a year at Duke University in the States. Um, but it was, it was actually going from London to Manchester that opened my eyes to the fact that there was something outside the southeast of England. <laughs> and, and then from Manchester to, to the opportunities in the rest of the world. And when I was looking around at, and being offered vice-chancellor um, president opportunities, obviously I looked really carefully. A move to Australia is a massive move. Um, the more I found out about UNSW, the more I found it irresistible. The ethos of the place, the innovative entrepreneurial approach, but combined with a very, very strong sense of social responsibility, which we may want to talk about a little bit, actually. Um, um, so it, it's about helping people. There really is here, and there has been since the 1800s when the university was founded. It goes right through to the foundation of the university in 1949 and has continued since. There is a spirit here about giving people opportunities they would not otherwise have had in a socially responsible way and educating them so that they want to give back to society afterwards. So thanks for asking that question. We will be the higher priced, I suspect. I mean, that's, that if, if it happens, I mean, right now, of course, you'll, you'll be following this just as much as me, there is an impasse, and it, it doesn't look like they'll get through. Um, there will then be competition. Um, there's competition for getting the best students, and there'll be, there'll be price will be part of that whole process. What I can tell you is that we will not be charging ridiculous fees. I'm very concerned about two things. One is that if fees are too high, 18-year-old or 17 or 18 or 19-year-old students making their decisions will be making decisions now because they can get loans without considering what that sort of level of debt might mean to them when they're in their 30s, 40s or 50s. So I'm very concerned that we don't load students with ridiculous levels of debt. And secondly, I'm even more concerned that the, the fee levels don't put off people from less privileged backgrounds. So we, I, personally, I'm very conscious of that, and I know that the whole university is very conscious of that. So we won't be getting to ridiculous fee levels. The, the other side of the equation, of course, 
is that if Australia needs a vibrant, successful, highly competitive higher education sector. And actually, when I look at the scene as I've been arriving and looking around, I don't think that the arguments for that have been well made enough. Most of the arguments seem to be for, for a, a vibrant higher education sector and the economic benefits seem to be around the number of international students we can attract. That is important and is important for the Australian economy. But there are so many benefits for society of having a properly funded, top-level, high-caliber university sector in terms of the, the people you produce, what they do for society, but also in, in terms of the diversification of the Australian economy, the, the discovery, um, knowledge transfer, application pipeline. I don't think the arguments for that have been made well enough. I see um, public, public funding for universities as an investment in universities for what they can bring back to society in terms of social progress, but also in terms of economic prosperity. It's, it's down to people like me, the presidents and vice chancellors of the universities, to make that argument, and that's something that I'll, I'll be engaging in very, very heavily over the next few months. And if you start to make that argument, of course, then you can articulate the public benefit from a university education. You can justify government funding, as well as the private benefit, which students at some point, I think it is reasonable for them to pay for, up to a, a reasonable level. I have to be really careful getting into that because of I am only in my first few weeks and I'm, I'm beginning now to really get to understand the, the admissions criteria and how it works and the debate, the really healthy debate I think about, is ATAR score the right thing? Are there other things? And I know there are various ways in which there's, there are adjustments are made and there are, very, there are lots of discussions about how can you incorporate other aspects of a, of a young person's life in making that decision. So I'm, it's not that I want to dodge the question. I don't think that I'm informed enough to give you a detailed answer. But what I can say is that what... I'll just go back to the point. I'm interested in the most talented people who can best benefit from an education at UNSW coming here. The, the, the thing for a UNSW really is, what is the added value we can bring through a degree here? And given that, we need to look at people in the round. And you, I, I, I think you're hinting that... Maybe too much emphasis on ATARs and perhaps there are other things and, and I would agree with that. How we introduce it and, 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 and modify the system, I'd need a little bit more time before I could comment on detail. Is that a fair answer? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, thank you for asking. Thank you for asking. I, was, I, I could have actually, so I was going to say a bit about me, and then I was going to tell you about the, the approach I'm taking as I come into this university, and I just thought, well, maybe that wasn't what you wanted to know. But since you've asked, I could go on for about an hour and a half now. Um, <laughs> now, I'm delighted you asked the question. So I've, I've come into this university doing three things. First of all, I am now running the university. So anything that goes wrong here, it lands on me. I am now responsible. I'm, I'm, I'm doing it, and it's, that's... A massive task and it's really exciting. I'm loving every minute. The second thing is that I am engaging with staff, students, alumni and people like yourselves who, who care about this university and want to know what it's doing. I have a massive engagement process going on. I'm in, in the next four months I will visit all 51 schools in the university for two to three hours. By the end of May, so I won't be able to dodge that sort of question by the end of May, I will know more than anyone else about the university by the end of May. But the third thing is, really importantly, I've kicked off immediately a new strategic planning process, a 10-year strategic planning process, 2015 to 2025. And that planning process is going to involve a very, very strong consultation from staff and students. So there's a lot of bottom-up, but it can't just be bottom-up. It's a very big organisation, 52,000 students, 6,000 staff. So I have to give a steer, and that is what I can give you on the strategy. There are three major headings for me. Number one is academic excellence. Number two is social engagement. And number three is global impact. Not in that order. They are the three top level strategic priorities. Academic excellence, social engagement, and global impact. 
And if you give me just a few minutes, I'll unpack those for you a bit to the same level that I've unpacked them for staff and students. So if I unpack the academic, and remember that I'm only unpacking them a little bit because there is a consultation process going on. Academic excellence, there are three things that I'm offering and suggesting. Number one is using novel technology to improve the student experience. There is increasing evidence, uh, higher education is going to change dramatically in the next 5, 10, 15 years. And UNSW should be right at the forefront of that. And one of those things is about how you use novel technology. How do you get students out of great big lecture theatres and use the time more effectively to personalise and individualise education? Can you do mentoring, assessment, feedback, monitoring, all of those things better? There is really good evidence that novel technology can improve the quality of education. It's not just a, quick, a way of dumbing it down and, and getting more efficiency. The second thing is about individualising and personalising the student experience. How can we do that? I'm challenging staff to think about how we do that. It is challenging because there's so many students here, but we, I'm sure we can do it. And the third thing about academic excellence is about improving research quality. We're 100th in the world out of 30,000. That's not bad, but we can and should do better. Sydney is in the top three cities in the world as far as I'm concerned. It has iconic buildings in the top few in the world. It has law firms and banks in the top few in the world, why wouldn't we have a university in the top 10, 20 or 25 in the world? Not because we want to be the top of a league table, but because when you look at the top 50 universities of the world, it's what they contribute to society, the massive impact they have, positive contribution they make to people's lives. So that's where we want to be. We're doing it, we want to be better. So that's academic excellence. I'll just quickly outline the other two areas. Social engagement, three things there. Um, first one is equality, and I've already talked about that a bit. Equality in terms of student entry, equality of opportunity. Equality in pro for progression of our staff in their careers, regardless of gender, ethnic group, indigenous origin, or socioeconomic group. And equality in the way we impact as a university on society and debate those issues with society. The second area under social engagement is to make UNSW a forum an international and national forum for debate and discussion about the really big issues that face our society. What I would call the grand challenges for society. We won't take on all the grand challenges. What we'll do is pick four, five or six where we have expertise to contribute. And we will then encourage debate, discussion and policy formulation in those areas and you know, schools and other organisations around New South Wales and around the country will be we will want to engage them in, in, in that debate. And the third area of social engagement is a rather different one. It's about what I call knowledge transfer. It's about making sure that our university is at the forefront of taking the discoveries that we make and applying them for the benefit of society, applying them to get benefits from it, but also to get economic progress, diversification and prosperity. And um, we're pretty good at it here, but I don't think universities in Australia have done it to the level that other universities around the world have. So that's a, a big opportunity there for us. It's not about dumbing down the discovery side. It's about when there are great discoveries in the university, picking up those bubbles of discovery and applying them for the benefit of society and the economy. And the final area is global impact. Um, we do, first thing there to offer you is international education. We, 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 Amazingly, and I think this is one of the great things for, for your students about coming here, we, we are in the top five universities in the world for the number of international students we have. That's amazing. Um, and that adds to the experience your students obtain here. It also throws in some, some interesting challenges. Where do we go with that? How can we build on that? There's so much that UNSW has to offer internationally in education. How do we do that? Um, the second thing then is there is about partnership. Partnership with three, four or five of the great universities around the world, that can offer students more opportunities as well. And then finally, what is the contribution this university makes in the developing world? I, my view is that a university like this, in such a privileged society, and I, I always remind our staff and students that all, despite all the talk about austerity, what are the top three countries in the world for per capita income? Switzerland, Norway and Australia. This is an incredibly privileged country. 
We have fantastic resources at this university. That goes with the responsibility for us to think about and work with and do what we can for people in less privileged parts of the world. So I'm, as we, we are looking at the mapping what everyone does in the developing world, and it's a lot of work, and from there, um, we will work out what can we do in the developing world for less privileged societies that's financially feasible, logistically sustainable, etc. So that's my, um, you are, sorry, I've gone on a bit long, but you did ask. So that's my strategic outline, academic excellence, social engagement and global impact. Thank you very much. I hope to do the career limiting move of cutting off the vice chancellor. Thank you very much. So Ian has been making his way around the university, as he said, and one of the things that he has done recently, which I'll make sure that we show the video of during morning tea, um, is make his way around campus on the UNSW robo couch. Um, so I'll make sure that video is available so you can see that at morning tea. It's very enjoyable. Um, I am going to now introduce you to Elizabeth Rosser, who is from UNSW Foundation Studies. She's going to be giving you a little bit of in information about the foundation program here at UNSW, and then I will be coming up after that as well. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you, Professor Jacobs. Um, as a staff member, a long-term staff member of UNSW, I have to say it's so refreshing. Um, it's, it's wonderful, it's exciting, because the academics that work in this university have that vision and it's great to have someone at the helm that's going to help us re-engage with that vision because I think if you have a look at education in Australia, particularly higher education, there has been quite a lot of divergence from those types of visions that we had into an economic rationalist paradigm. So very exciting, looking forward to working with you. Okay, I'm going to talk to you this morning about UNSW Foundation Studies and looking at streamlined pathways to success at university. Um, foundation Studies at UNSW is um, the longest running and arguably the leading foundation program in Australia. Um, we are part of the university and our programs and processes um, obtain oversight from the faculties and schools within the university and our programs are ratified by the Board of Studies of UNSW. Um, as, as you're here on campus, I don't need to talk to you about the facilities because they will speak for themselves and what you will notice is there's enormous investment into upgrading those facilities to make sure we are ready for the global impact. Rather than talking to you too much, um, I'd like you to have a look at foundation studies and the way in which we prepare for our students for an undergraduate degree at UNSW and for all other universities throughout Australia. Foundation Studies is the longest running pre-university preparation program in Australia. The university is part of the Group of Eight, a coalition of leading Australian universities. Located on the Kensington campus of UNSW Australia, our students quickly become part of the university community. Our programs are taught in English and create a bridge between school and university so that our graduates have the greatest chance of success in their undergraduate studies. As well as independent learning habits, they form academic, social and career networks that provide a strong foundation for success in an increasingly globalised career market. And what's even better, there's a lot of fun to be had along the way. Most of our classes are a lot of fun. There are activities, you get to go around, you get to learn things from different points of view. It's not just sitting and learning through a book. students receive a university style education. Let's take a look at what this involves.
So m most of you here will be taking this in and looking at the international profile of our students. Um, and we're very proud of that. We have students from basically at the moment about 53 countries of the world and they add an enormous diversity to the thinking and the um, ideas generation um, that is available to us. But we're also open for domestic students under special circumstances. So in no way would UNSW Foundation Studies be looking to be a primary pathway for domestic students into universities. The schools do that beautifully and in an age appropriate way. But Foundation Studies, as part of the equity agenda, wants to make sure that students who, for whom the school pathway has not been successful in leading them to the university career that they wish to have, uh, that they do have some access points. Now, for entry into Foundation students, a domestic student, that is, a citizen of Australia or a permanent resident, would have to satisfy one of these conditions. So they either have had an international education background, perhaps their parents have been expat at some um, other country than Australia, or they have had a primary um, amount of their education overseas and then migrated to Australia. Another condition is that they may have experienced a disrupted education. And there are a whole range of reasons for that. You know, ill health, family disruption, economic disruption. We don't know, but we look at these on a case-by-case -case basis. Another condition is that the student, for whatever reason, has underperformed at their year 12 or HSC equivalents. And going back to redo that qualification is not the best option for that student. So if any of those conditions, it's, it's not and, it's or, if any of those conditions are in place, it may be that the student would be well placed in a university preparation course located within the university because of that very tight connection with the faculties. So we will say what everyone says at an event like this. You know, we have high quality programs, but the reality is we do. We open ourselves up to great scrutiny and collaboration, and we are in a path of continual improvement. We're committed, we love our work. And so that's what we offer your students. We do have tailored streams that go into the major faculty areas within the university and the subject choices within those streams of study are chosen by the university. So they're the things that the university believes are of critical importance for a student commencing their undergraduate studies. So we want the student to have a really strong foundation where they can pick up and move into their studies and achieve excellence at a very fast rate. For you, as a career advisor, it will be useful to know that um, a domestic student, we would normally expect to have completed their HSC and as a rough guide, be looking at an ATAR between about 60 to 75. We have various PACE programs. So a student at the upper end of the ATAR range might be doing a transition program, which is 13 weeks plus exams about three months. Um, a student in the mid would be looking at around about um, a, a standard program of about nine months. And then the students who are at the lower end of that range may be looking at a plus program of around about 12 months. And they're open for both first and second semester. So there's a lot of detail that is attached to all of that. So. I would imagine that some of your students might have questions or you might have questions. So please visit the website or give our admissions team a ring. All of this is available from the website and you will have access to the slides um, after the presentation. So that just leaves me to say 
thank you for giving me the opportunity to talk to you about what we do and to wish you the very best for the academic year. Enjoy your networking opportunities that are presented by this event. All right, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth. Uh, we now have just a slide quickly to show you all of the pathways that we do have. So foundation is one of those pathways. This is the rest of them. So we have access, so that's all of the details there, which you are probably very familiar with. The U at UNSW pathway, UNSW prep for students who are between the ages of 17 and 19 and have an ATAR above at least a 50 um, and are EAS eligible. And then also the university preparation program for mature age students. So anyone over the age of 20 by the 1st of March in the year in which they enroll. So this information is available um, and will be provided to you in a slide as well, but it gives you a, that full snapshot of the, the pathway programs that we do have here at UNSW. Next up, we have UNSW scholarships and Ben Alfred is here to chat with you a bit about those. Thank you, Ben. Thank you, Jonathan, and um, I just want to say thank you to all, to all of you for taking the time to be here. Um, it's great to be able to share with you um, some of the scholarship opportunities that are available and hopefully provide you with some information that you can take back to your current students who are interested in coming to UNSW and applying for our scholarships. So for 2014, um, for our high school leaver scholarships, um, we offered 150 distinct scholarship schemes, um, which ended up providing scholarships for 900 students. This slide and the next one is just to give you a bit of an indication of what is available. Um, as you see from the previous slide, there's a large number of schemes, but these are the main ones um, and some that I thought that might be interesting for you here today. Um, some are cross faculty, so that doesn't matter which faculty students come to. Um, our Academic Achievement Award, uh, the UNSW Cientia Scholarship, which is for very high achieving students receiving who receive an ATAR of 99.9 .9 or above, they'll be automatically made an offer of that scholarship. Our VC Alumni Scholarships, which is one of our equity scholarships um, that's been touched on. Um, there's quite a large mix of equity scholarships that are available here at UNSW. Um, I'll touch on a very, uh, very interesting scheme from the um, Faculty of Engineering um, in a minute. The John Green Scholarship in Law um, is again one of our equity scholarships. Um, that is that provides part tuition, part stipend for the successful recipients of that. So we generally have between one and two students each year receiving that scholarship. Uh, sorry, John Green scholarship is so good I put it in twice. Um, the. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, the Faculty of Engineering Rural um, Scholarships is a great scheme um, that provides, uh, this year we provided 11 scholarships um, to assist students in different, in the different um, areas of engineering study. Um, and obviously there's a focus on people who come from rural areas to support them to come to Sydney. Okay, so there's a whole different set of considerations, which I'm sure you're aware of, for people to leave their home outside of Sydney and come and study. And hopefully, if they will receive that scholarship, it goes a long way to helping them succeed at university. Access Assist Scholarships, again, that's one of our equity scholarships, probably the largest one, or one of our largest ones. We offer 25 of those scholarships each year. And the Balnave Scholarship for, for Indigenous students studying medicine, $25,000 per year. Okay, so there's a large and a broad cross-section of scholarships available here at UNSW. Okay, so applying. This, um, the process of applying here at UNSW is all online. What we ask our applicants to do is to build a profile, okay? Um, and what they need to do 
is pick their target, so their course, um, what they're interested in, okay? Stay focused on it, and then what we advise in the scholarships office is just to go for it. So what are we looking for? When students are building their profile on our website, we do ask them to answer five general questions about themselves. Each applicant for a scholarship here at UNSW has to complete these questions. Academic achievement, community involvement, the ability to contribute to university life. Um, I think that's, that's a really important one, so it's making clear that it's not just about what you do in the classroom, it's how you contribute outside the classroom. Leadership skills. And obviously the interest in the program at UNSW is key, okay? For, the, for a lot of the scholarships, they will be assessed by our office, but we also engage with our faculties, um, academic staff, um, in terms of the uh, assessment and ranking of scholarships. So academic staff um, will be seeing the applications, so obviously some insight into why they want to study a particular program is key. Okay, so what happens next? Um, it is true to say, obviously, that some students, most students will actually miss out on receiving a scholarship, okay? Um, however, it's also important to recognise that just to receive an offer to study at UNSW is an outstanding achievement as well. Um, students who come here also have the ability to apply for scholarships as, as current students. So if they do miss out um, in the first year, there's always opportunities in the future. Thank you. Um, <laughs> um, and it is true to say too that for most of our scholarships that are length of degree, we do require a certain level of academic performance um, for students to be able to maintain their scholarships. And finally, I just wanted to say thank you. Um, if you wanted to contact us at um, UNSW scholarships, there are our details. Um, and I'll also um, be here for morning tea. So if you've got any questions then, please feel free to come and ask. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ben. Um, we now have Michelle Morris and one of our co-op scholars as well to chat with you about the co-op scholarship here at UNSW. Good morning, everyone. Um, it's lovely to see so many of you. I have said hi to a few and I hope I'll get to chat to more um, at morning tea. Um, my time up here is going to be very, very brief, um, so I am available to answer any questions along with Trina De Leon, our um, applications um, manager as well, um, because I am going to hand over to Simon who can speak from his own experience in the program. Um, so I am hoping that the majority of you are already familiar with the co-op program, um, career development scholarship that has evolved from a demand in industry um, aimed and looking for high achieving scholars who want to build their career skills as well as their technical skills and their soft skills while they are here at UNSW. So I'm for those of you who are familiar and those who aren't, um, these are the really key points of the co-op program scholarship. So um, the real power of the scholarship is in that grouping of all of those areas, not just the financial support that allows students to focus on their studies um, and to take that time to do their industry placements, but in the leadership training and the professional development program that runs from the very first day and all the way through until they graduate, um, their networking and mentoring program that goes along with that and helps them develop as a professional before they're actually graduating from university. So they really are career ready to go out into the world. So as everybody um, who attends today, you have received this in your, um, in your little bag, so I'm not going to dwell on it, but we've covered all of the things that um, we're usually asked for. So the application summary is there. Um, you've got the profile of activities um, and achievements that co-op scholars that are in the program who've joined us for 2015 um, have been a part of. Again, just a snapshot of a variety of things students have been involved in. No one student was involved in all of these. Please keep that in mind. It's not a tick list. Um, 
And we have actually introduced a, a new part for that, um, that summary for you as well this year, which is how did the, the 2015 scholars find out about the co-op program? Um, again, to highlight your very critical role in making sure that information gets out there. So um, careers advisors at 58% totally leading that charge, so thank you for that. Um, points to note, practical experience and links with industry really are considered crucial to success um, in today's environment and, and in the world today. So um, this packaging of the experience is really um, vital, I think, to, to your students' success um, ongoing. Industry really are looking for a better gender balance. So please, um, it seems that the, the gentlemen um, applicants are certainly confident and, and really willing to have a go. We really do need to encourage more females to apply for the program's um, availabilities as well. And the career information evenings, we host um, about five career information evenings across different streams um, during the year, but they really are very important for your students to be able to see a, about the industry and the career itself beyond the degree. So many students get focused on the degree part um, that those information evenings can be really important. Some new developments from uh, 2016, the value of the co-op program scholarship will increase. You might think I would tell you that today, how much that will go up to. I can't at this point, um, but we'll certainly be communicating that to you in our mail out. The new engineering structure um, will begin this year, so it brings into line the placements for engineering students become, um, I suppose, more in line with the other programs, the business programs, and that's starting this year. And then we're streamlining even further the school's assessment page and the, the part of the process that you're involved with. I did see a couple of hands go, yes, um, because of the timing of that. Um, we will, again, we'll communicate a little bit um, later on with you in the April mail out how that's going to come about. But um, we are looking at, we have heard you and we are looking at giving you a little bit more time there. In terms of the key dates, I've started with interview offers for no apparent reason. Um, we will open applications again beginning of May. We'll have scholarships information evening on the 15th of July and applications will close the 30th of September. Interview offers will be um, the last day of HSC, so the 5th of November. And as I said, we will be hosting those careers information evenings again this year across a variety of streams um, and we'll be in touch with more about that. Most importantly, please, please, please book a school visit. I have a team of very, very um, engaged and enthusiastic scholar ambassadors who want to come out and talk about the program um, with your scholars if they're interested. Um, and just finally, before I do hand over to Simon, um, Unfortunately, year on year on year, we hear from you and we hear from students um, that they have self-selected. They've not put in an application because they did not think that they could possibly um, hit that ATAR, get the scholarship, whatever it might be. Please, please encourage them not to self-select. Put in the application. We are looking for well-rounded students. We do want to hear their passion and their motivation, um, and we look forward to receiving their scholarship uh, applications. So I'm going to hand across to Simon and hop off. Hello everyone, my name is Simon Grace and I'm your Co-op Scholar. I'm here to talk to you about two things in particular. One is the really important role career advisors play in students' lives, such as myself. And the second is about the life of a Co-op student. Currently I'm studying my final year in a Bachelor of Commerce Information Systems, Co-op, and I'm about as far away from the general stereotype as you can get. Um, which is why I'm privileged to tell you the unlikely story of my time as a co-op. When I first heard about the co-op program, I was already halfway through my first year in international studies. I had no experience in IT and of course had hardly considered a career in it. I'll tell you why. I had always been a musician. Understandably, in my high school, the Conservatorium of Music, uh, they had geared students to the lofty heights of the musical elite. But of course, the career advisors saw this and did not think to emphasize such a wonderful program, and I truly wish they had. There's a great sense of community among the co-op scholars, and I see the truth in the statement every single day that great students come from diverse backgrounds. The greatness of the co-op program thereby extends to the diversity of its cohort. 
This is why I truly wish that all students have the opportunity to apply for such an experience, and which is why all of you can make such a massive difference to the lives of students similar to myself. My fellow co-ops and I have not just developed skills and perspectives that will be employed in our future workplaces, but in all manners of life. I think probably most, the most important lesson we have learned is that we must and we are always able to learn if we stay open, humble, and willing to listen. Accordingly, within your industry placements, you receive exposure to a wide variety of industries. In total, so far, I have worked in the transport, consulting, uh, services, software, economic development, and even the online gaming industries. And in each of these, you receive an incredible amount of responsibility. My favorite is always the time on a Saturday morning at 10 o'clock when I was called by the vice president of SAP. I was catching up on much needed sleep after a college party when I heard Samir say, Simon, what are you doing tomorrow night? Are you free? I chuckled as I had learned to go along with these kind of things when he said, do you want to come to New Zealand? There's some guys I'd love for you to meet. I was sent to New Zealand to deliver a presentation on the future of innovation and its implications on the tax industry. It was, it was a $1.5 billion case, and so I naturally had 24 hours to research in depth the tax system of New Zealand, for all things. The client, the technological progression for the last 20 years, the New Zealand politics and dot com, and many other facets required to make such a delivery. But of course, thanks to the co-op community and the support I had always been given, I had the training, experience, and support I needed to make this in an effective and timely manner. And if I didn't know how important future students would need to know the basics of technology and how businesses utilize it, I most certainly do now. Moving on to the university side of the co-op's experience. Is it more time? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, well, basically, I'll go and say, uh, what will your students achieve if they can successfully manage university, work and social life? Whatever they dream of. When they're presented with the opportunity to change, make a change in the world, to pair it with the drive to see it happen. I'm humbled with three amazing graduate offers, but I choose, if I choose not to go into the IIT industry, the co-op experience will serve me for the better every single day. It is an amazing opportunity to immerse yourself in your passions, as well as get into a broader understanding. If you want the best future for your students out there, it starts here. Thank you very much. Thank you, Simon. Um, we now have uh, Bruce Watson, yes? Is yes. that right? I looked a while ago. Um, from the Faculty of Built Environment here to discuss built environment, obviously, and the portfolio. Hi. Thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. My name's Bruce Watson. I'm the Director of Interior Architecture in the Faculty of Built Environment. I'm actually an academic, so once I start talking, I might have trouble stopping. So hopefully your alarm will go off at some point. So I've been asked to speak to you about the alternative admissions scheme, which we implemented in 2013, and which has been a really successful scheme for us. That scheme allows us to uh, interview students and take students into our courses through an interview and portfolio process. It allows them to enter with 10 marks lower than the advertised ATAR. So this came about in 2013 because, well, we had a hunch that the ATAR, whilst it delivers some really great scholarly attributes in the students we get, that it was also possibly missing some attributes within the creative fields which we thought were, were necessary. So in 2013 to 14, we started the scheme where students apply via a cover letter that sort of supports and documents their their response to the degree they want to enter, and they submit a portfolio. <laughs> now, the, what I prepared was actually for uh, students in one of the workshops that we provide to help students with it. So it's quite long, so I, I might just uh, provide the information without a lot of uh, the slides. So portfolios within the creative industries of architecture, landscape architecture, industrial design, and interior architecture are 
the vehicle for getting jobs. They're the things that you go and take to an interview as well as your CV to show your experience. So it's part of our industry. So in asking the students to submit a portfolio, it was mimicking uh, somewhat what is part of our industry already. So what we look for in the portfolio is a demonstration of some creative processes or outputs from art or design and technology or fashion. I think that sits under the textiles area. So each student, we try not to be too prescriptive about what the portfolio is because we've found that by doing that it really inhibits the way students may uh, depict their creativity and so we leave it quite open. It is limited to five pages, five A4 pages which are submitted electronically to us. We look for that sort of narrative that the student can tell through their creative work. So if they've been in the art, in an art subject, that they depict the story of how they created their final piece or a narrative that builds to their final piece rather than just the final piece. Same with design and technology. Design, you know, that they show the way one of their items has been thought through, the research that was used to develop their idea, the science that was developed to analyse the idea, and then the creation of the output, which is the product. So we review these portfolios. In the interior architecture degree last year for 2015, we had 100 applicants. We then interviewed 60 of them and they were all really worthy. Of that 60, we recommended 40 were suitable to come into the degree or to be uh, viewed within the spectrum of being made an offer. That then depended on them getting within 10 marks of the ATAR. So this year, I believe, and it's still sort of finalising itself on Monday, <laughs> uh, we will be taking in about 15 to 20 of those students. So I think that may be the full story of, I hope I've covered that. I'd ask you if you want to put your hand up and ask any questions, but I don't think I'm allowed, so we won't do that. Uh, sorry. But it has been a very, very successful initiative for us. It's allowed us to reach out into the community of students and gather other students that may not have otherwise had a chance to enter the university. Um, we're very proud of the scheme. One last thing, the students that we took on in 20... This is a very interesting point. I'm nearly there. The students that we took on in 2014 and finished their first year in 14 are now going into second year. Some of those guys had well below the, the published ATAR. I have mapped their progression through their first year of study and most of them, if not all of them, have ended up in the top 10% of their classes, which we are finding quite, you know, I mean, it was a good thing because it proved us slightly right, the hunch, right? It's initial research. When I interviewed them and asked them why, they felt that the way to study in a university suited them more than their tertiary studies. That was one of the aspects, that the freedom and the way they could sort of develop their own way of moving through courses rather than, I guess, the, the other way through a, uh, a school, a predictable way of studying. Uh, oh, sorry to say that, predictable, but don't you? <laughs> um, was, was better suited to their, they were better suited, suited to a university context. So it's been very successful. So we'd encourage you to um, encourage this scheme amongst your students. Five more minutes. I went too quick. <laughs> Bruce will be available um, for questions afterward in morning tea, so please do hold those questions for after. So the portfolio, you know, look, I could, I could see so this was really based on some of presenting to the students ways of thinking about assembling. I'll just get to some images. You know, portfolios come in all shapes and sizes. There's something we use in the industry to demonstrate our abilities and skills and projects we've worked on. So they, they take many shapes. So there was no real definition of a portfolio that we could give to the students in that it should capture in their best possible way 
um, what it was that, that they had done that they thought we would be interested in, and telling a story, a narrative. So it was for students, so I tried to make this quite... I'm just going through to some more images. So, you know, the set-out was important to us, how neat and tidy they had considered the set-out of the portfolio. How they had considered the composition of the portfolio. How they'd set it out to make it individual and attractive. Interesting. It needed to have some interest to it. It needed to catch our attention. I believe this is all on our YouTube page, uh, our faculty's YouTube page. Uh, how had they considered themselves as a brand? How had they thought about their own work that they'd achieved in their creative fields in the school context as their brand, not as just as an individual and shaped their portfolio in that way? Like I said, they come in many shapes and many sizes. So we didn't really want to depict exactly what this should look like because we found in our teaching and learning over the many years that we need to leave students with some scope to be creative. That's what creative is. It's not being completely 100% explicit about what you want. So thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Thank you, Bruce. Um, and again, like I said, Bruce will be available during morning tea if you do have any other questions. I'd now like to welcome up Don, uh, Dr. Von Rees from the Faculty of Art and Design at UNSW, formerly known as COFA, for those of you who know it that way. Um, I will get your presentation up in just one moment. Perfect. There you go. Thank you, Von. Okay, the only thing that stands between you and morning tea is my presentation. <laughs> you don't have to take notes, okay? It's not a test. So yes, we, you would have known us as COFA, we're now UNSW Art and Design. And that's an important step for us because we've made massive changes in the last couple of years. And those changes have been under the great leadership of our dean, who's here today as well to support this. Do you want to stand up for a second? There he is. <laughs> so it's, it's a wonderful little supportive community that is part of this great university. So I'll show you a little bit about what the place looks like. Um, it's not in this precinct, it's close by. Um, that's to our advantage in some instances and also the attachment to the university is a great advantage. You may feel free to dance at certain parts too. Our technology is a lot better on the art and design campus, I can tell you. I'm an old school teacher. Okay. <laughs> In desperation to take over. <laughs> okay, so where that visual failed us, I can tell you something about the place. The location is, is been there for a long, long time. More than 100 years we're finding out now. So it's a very old institution in some ways, but a very contemporary one now. Um, Mr. Rudd gave us $58 million to it. Change it, rework it, to make it into a futuristic campus, and that's what it is. It's a great little community, uh, and so we've got, we're right in the centre of all the things that are happening. So for us, art, design, and media, we've got Fox Studios just nearby for media. We've got the old traditional galleries all throughout Paddington. We're right beside that. And of course, you all know about how Surrey Hills is the new design precinct. So, fantastic, and nestled right there in a very exciting hub. So we've got a major um, undergraduate degree. We'll start with design, and design is a it's a wonderful new area. And you can you know people are talking about design all the time now. You are interested in design. You buy design, and so you know that one time with careers advisors, if someone came along and said they wanted to do art or design, 
He kind of raised your eyebrows. Uh, so mm -hmm. you know, architecture. You know, engineering. No, this is our era. It's the fastest growing job market in the world. You know, so that is great for our business. Great for you, and it's a good story for all those people who are creative. The second interesting thing that's happening is that combination with double degrees. Students want that greater breadth to what they're doing. And one of our most popular ones at the moment is the new degree, Bachelor of Design, paired with the Bachelor of Media, PR and Advertising. So it's a great little combination there. And we know that it's successful because the students are applying for it. They want to be part of it. Our media arts, the great combination that's been going for a while now is the great media arts with animation, sound, interactivity, exciting, and in connection with computer science, you have those amazing people who can use both sides of their brain. They can do all the creative work and all the scripting as well. So that's a fantastic combination. We can see that's very successful in the world. Our traditional fine arts degree, so we honour the atelier system, the, the studio type system. And remember, our place is about making hands on. You know? We're in there, we get dirty. It's a great sensation. So um, we deal with the traditions, painting, drawing, sculpture, but also at the same time, our students just casually move right across to new technology. And so they seamlessly move across one another. So it's a very exciting. And those combinations are working quite well too, especially the, the new emerging fine arts and science combination. Um, art history, art theory, the, the explosion of galleries throughout the world, not just in Australia. See these students going into different positions there. But also, kind of interesting enough, we have people coming out of art history and theory working in the film industry. And they're advising on costume and interiors. So there's all sorts of new jobs coming up that we've probably never realised before. I've got another video now, and if this second video doesn't work, there'll be trouble. I saw an anime on, on TV and that was the first time I encountered that kind of storytelling and when I was in high school my visual arts teacher brought in two guests from uh, previous students from the College of Fine Arts and one of them did the degree of digital media and she spoke about it and I just thought oh that'd be amazing to do for her to say you can do it just it spurred me on. Currently I work on props and characters. Once you get into doing a project you meet so many people with a lot of different sets of set of skills working children So the, for your purposes, those little bites, we've got about 20 of them now on our website. So when you're talking with students, it's easy for you to go to the website and, and show those off. And they're great. There's a whole range of people. And the actual graduates talking about their experience and the job they're in now. There's nothing better than that when they actually talk about their life. You know? So that's quite convincing. And also you can see, students can see themselves in those situations, which is perfect. So there is about 20 of them, and they have a full range of the different types of occupations our students go out to. 
So some things to keep in mind. Our reputation, number one for creative arts research in Australia, if you had any doubts. Our degrees, our degrees are moving, all, just about all the undergraduate ones are now four years long. They're honours degrees. And the big advantage, of course, is we have professional experience in each degree. That means that all our students are professionalised through the process. We have staff, uh, a very broad international staff at the moment, uh, people coming from everywhere, because they're kind of attracted to the place, the philosophy we've got and what we're doing. So, of course, everyone benefits from that. Our location, as I told you before, is perfectly located between those important districts and a close relationship to this university. Our strong careers and industry links are very important. We have practitioners who come in, who actually teach the students, who mentor the students. I look after the uh, professional experience program in the Bachelor of Design. I have 1,000 companies built up across 22 countries. So, that's an amazing relationship, and it's taken a long time. It's built on trust, and of course, the high quality of our students. So our students have dreams. They want to work with a great fashion designer in London. We can do that. And that great fashion designer in London, Mary, she tells us that our graduates are the best she's had. And she gets them from all around the world. So we've built this reputation on, on our students who are intelligent, flexible, up with new technology, no old technology, and have a work ethic. So some of the things that make our community very special is, and it's that added on bonus. One thing is the internship. Another thing is their ability to uh, mix with a range of people. There's about 3,000 students in the community and from over 50 different countries. So there's that great cultural mix going on there. Um, the ability for them to have an internship in Australia or overseas, and of course, the, uh, their chance to uh, do an exchange. So, great scenario is uh, a student, I'll tell you a real story, a student who wants to do anime um, graphics in Japan, begins, young bloke, yeah, very excited, draws really well, he wants to go there, can't speak Japanese, so we organise his program all the way through, you do Japanese as general education, then in your third year, we send you to Kensai Gadai in Japan. He goes there, he has that rich experience. His courses are parallel, so he doesn't get behind in his degree. He learns more Japanese and Japanese-ness. And then we organise for him to stay in Japan and do his professional experience there. Wonderful, huh? Next, I'll be organising marriages <laughs> on work. <laughs> it's all part of the service. So it's a great creative environment, you know, with a whole range of things, go activities going on. They're transparent, visible, and you're giving me the eye. <laughs> it's all there. You've got it on your USB. Um, I'll be available outside with my <laughs> colleagues if you want to have anything more to chat about. We have portfolio entry as well, alternative entry because we know that particularly art and design students like to show off their portfolio. And I th finally, I want to really thank you. We know that the relationship internationally <coughs> with students with their agents has now become almost sacred. And I think that may become the trend for us. Just remember your role is very important in shaping someone for the rest of their life. And the more informed you are, the better that life will be for that student. So thank you for that. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. So if I could get you to be back in this theater by about 10.55-ish, maybe 58-ish, so that we can get right started at 11 a.m. So again, morning tea is upstairs. Please feel free to use the facilities either down here or upstairs behind the bar, just to the left of the bar. See you back here in about half an hour. Thank you. Hello, hello. Buenos dias, como estas? 
Okay, so if I can get you to take your seats, that would be lovely and wonderful. We are going to kick off the second part of our program today, um, and I am going to be introducing you to Professor Ian, Associate Professor Darren Curnow from the Faculty of Science to just discuss some very interesting things with you. So Professor Curnow is here. Perfect, I will welcome you up. I promised that I would have the VC riding around on the robo couch. I will get that to you after the next break. Um, so stay tuned. Thank you. Yes, yeah, sure, no problem. Well, good morning, everyone. It's, uh, it's a great thrill for me to be here today. Okay, I'll wait till everyone's ready. <laughs> Quite a, a large group and everybody obviously firing on uh, caffeine at the moment, which is great. Um, I'm going to talk a bit about the paleo diet today. Does anybody know if caffeine's on the paleo diet? <laughs> okay, so those of you who have had water are probably safe, but the rest of you? All right, so uh, it's a great thrill for me to be here today uh, to speak with you about what is my favorite subject, which is us, or humans, and particularly where we've come from in an evolutionary sense. And I believe this is actually one of the most exciting areas of science that we can be working in today. <coughs> Sorry. And one that changes almost daily. Of course, we live in a world in which science is placing, uh, playing an ever-increasing role in obvious and rapidly advancing areas like communication technology, and I hope you've all put your phones on silent, uh, medical science and clinical treatment, of course, and energy and infrastructure. And of course, science is helping us to understand the real threat that human-produced global warming poses, and its many wide-reaching implications for humans and all other life on the planet, as well, of course, in helping to find solutions. Yet there are, of course, branches in science that have a similarly high public profile, and as teachers, of course, you would know this, um, thinking about that the obsession that many young kids, particularly boys, have with things like dinosaurs, but which we might think of as historical sciences. Um, for example, astronomy and areas of physics, including astrobiology. And in the earth and biological sciences, where I belong, evolutionary biology, including paleontology and paleoecology, archaeology, and even areas of genetics. In my field, the science of human evolution, another historical science, we're focused on answering a set of rather fundamental questions, questions about uh, humankind, such as, where do we fit into the natural world? Just what kind of an animal are we? What are our unique features, features that set us apart from the rest of life? and how and why did they evolve? When, where, and how did our species, Homo sapiens, appear? When did the living populations of people originate? And how are we all related to each other? And even fascinating questions like, are we still evolving? Now, the evidence that we draw upon to answer these questions and to develop scientific theories about human origins is varied, very incomplete, and frequently difficult to interpret. Amazing fossilised remains such as these of humans and our human ancestors, or two-footed cousins, branches of the human evolutionary tree going back to around seven million years ago. We explore comparisons of the anatomy and behaviour of humans and our ape and other primate cousins. And of course our genes and genomes, in conclu in co concluding now the complete DNA sequence of chimpanzees, our closest living relative, and the long extinct Neanderthals, and a mysterious relative known as the Denisovans. And that's them there, that little finger bone, we don't know very much about them from a, a physical point of view, but we have their entire genome sequence now. And of course, ancient stone tools that provide direct evidence of the behavior and culture of our ancestors and cousins going back about two and a half million years. 
Now, I guess we could say that perhaps all of this is just an exercise in navel-gazing, an attempt to satisfy perhaps a deep yearning we all have to connect with nature and to understand our place within it. These are undoubtedly important issues and ones that are at the core of much philosophical and, of course, religious thinking as well. Or are there more practical consequences to what we can learn from our biological past? Uh, clearly there are, at least in the, the case of our Cro-Magnon ancestors and their interactions with some of our cousins. Um, to put it another way, what can we learn from the past to help inform the challenges we face today and into the future? And of course, I'd, I would argue heaps. There's stacks that we can learn from a question like this and thinking about our evolutionary past in this sort of way. And uh, I could give many, many examples. I won't, of course, because I'm very time limited. But if you're interested, you might like to read my blog and some of the articles that I've written for The Conversation, ABC Science, Australasian Science and other outlets. Um, I'm also uh, regularly on the radio in Sydney uh, in the media a lot talking about my field of research. Now, the example I'm going to briefly outline today is the so-called paleo diet, uh, sometimes also called the paleo lifestyle, being widely promoted, including by well-known celebrity chefs, and which, of course, has become very big business. <laughs> Finally, I got a laugh. Previous cartoon didn't work so well. Now, the paleo diet is based on a number of ideas that are, from a scientific perspective, largely incorrect. And the first of them being that because humans evolved to live as hunter-gatherers or foragers, we have a set of genetic adaptations for a very particular diet. And that the way we've lived for the last 5,000 to 10,000 years, but especially since the Industrial Revolution, has caused a stack of lifestyle diseases. We are, if you like, genetically mismatched for our lifestyle today. Now, this is, of course, the perspective of the paleo dieters. But they're also very clear that we've not evolved to eat things like grains or dairy, and that we should cut these foods, entire food groups, in fact, out of our diets altogether. Instead, we should eat a diet high in meat and fat and, of course, vegetables and fruit. Now, there certainly is evidence that our ancestors ate meat, and probably quite regularly, beginning perhaps more than three million years ago. Our ape cousins do eat meat occasionally, but mostly rather opportunistically. And the use of fire and cooking probably began also more than two million years ago. It's thought that cooking meat and vegetables may even have been the catalyst for the evolution of our large brains, providing extra energy for these energy-hungry organs. Now, a very interesting fact about our evolution is that we are the only mammal, apart from carnivores, for which tapeworms are a definitive host. In other words, they need us to reproduce. Tapeworms infect uh, millions of people around the, around the globe each year and are contracted from eating undercooked or raw meat from sheep, pigs and cattle. It may even be that we gave tapeworms to these other animals. Also, when we look at our gastrointestinal tract, it is about the same length as a chimpanzee's, our close cousins, but there are differences in the proportions that uh, speak to the dietary differences between our species. Our stomachs are about the same size, unless, of course, you've got a dessert stomach, which I certainly do. But our small intestine is about twice the length in humans, or about six metres long while our large intestine is only about half the length of a chimpanzee's. Now, the small intestine is where most of the nutrients in food are absorbed, so a longer one in humans is associated with a shift in diet in our ancestors toward eating high-quality foods. And you've just had some of those at morning tea because you're at UNSW, so... Now, the amount of animal versus plant foods hunter-gatherers ate varied enormously according to the environment that people lived in. In arid areas, as low as perhaps only 20% of the diet came from animal sources. But in the Arctic, around 90% or more of the diet was from animal food. Yet despite such an extreme diet as that of the Inuit and Eskimo peoples, 
there is no evidence of any genes associated with such, a lar such large amounts of meat eating. Humans are omnivores, we are not carnivores, and we have very flexible diets. Food choices are, and likely always have been, determined by availability in the environment, social learning and cultural practices, emotional responses, including uh, individual physiological differences, and even influenced by the bacteria that colonise our gut, and vice versa. So it's wrong to think that we are genetically programmed for a particular diet. We aren't. We can eat a lot of different things. And using our culture, we can make nutrition from many different sources accessible when it might not be without preparation or cooking. Yes, animal foods are important, but so are plant foods, a very wide variety of them, and probably even more so than meat. Now, hunter-gatherers mostly moved about a lot to take advantage of the foods they, as they became seasonally available to them. Evidence from recent hunter-gatherers shows that they worked very hard for their next meal. People moved camp up to 80 times a year, walking a total up to 750 kilometres. And each move walking somewhere between about four and 80 kilometres. Actually, if anything, this is the missing ingredient in our modern lifestyle. We don't move anywhere near as much as our ancestors did, especially in the modern world with occupations centred around technology and minimal physical activity. The other thing, of course, is that ancient humans certainly did eat grains, and probably large amounts of them. Now, the evidence for this resides in the archaeological record, where we see extensive evidence for grain eating, things like grinding stones for the processing of grains, or starch residues on stone tools, phytoliths, and pollen. But also in our genome, where we possess genes associated with the digestion of starch, the so-called salivary amylase genes, which produce an enzyme in our saliva to break down starch before we swallow it. We have three times as many starch amylase genes as the Neanderthals or Denisovans did, or our chimpanzee cousins have. So contrary to the paleo diet, we certainly have evolved to eat starch. Now, evolution also didn't stop with the end of the Stone Age. It continues even today, despite what paleo dieters might argue. It can't stop because it's built into the fabric of our biology, the way our cells divide and genes recombine as new cells are formed. And also, natural selection still operates and can't be eliminated despite amazing medical care, which is, of course, still restricted to the wealthiest nations anyway. So our species, Homo sapiens, evolved in sub-Saharan Africa around 200,000 years ago. Yet around 130,000 years later, a small subset of these Africans left the continent and settled Asia, Australia, Europe, and eventually the Americas and the Pacific. Yet, despite the remarkable distances travelled um, and the extraordinary diversity of environments that were occupied for the first time and changes in diets that must have taken place, there is actually very little evidence in the human genome from across the world of major genetic changes associated with this migration, which really underscores the amazing flexibility of our species. It wasn't until about 10,000 years ago that the most dramatic event in our evolution occurred since our species appeared about 200,000 years ago. This was the invention of farming. It marked a massive assault on our immune systems with many genetic changes associated with resistance to diseases, particularly infectious diseases. Um, with our changing diet came other genetic changes, genes allowing adults to metabolise lactose from dairy products those that facilitated alcohol digestion, our oral bacteria changed, and genetic mutations that conferred protection against diabetes. So many of us do have genes associated with eating and digesting dairy products, thanks to our farming ancestors. So again, it's incorrect to say we haven't evolved to eat dairy food. 
So as appealing as the idea of going back to a lifestyle our ancestors might seem, in reality it's impossible and actually not required. We're living longer now than ever and our knowledge of nature, our own bodies and our diet is better than it's ever been. There will always be controversies about lifestyle and fads like the paleo diet, but evolution shows that our ancestors were amazingly flexible and adaptable with no single diet characterising our species. I hope I've managed to give you at least a small taste of both the excitement and the relevance of today's, uh, to today's world of the study of human evolution science. It's not something just esoteric that involves digging up or studying broken old bones and teeth, but there's a great deal of relevance to um, what we study and engaging with contemporary issues. At UNSW, the study passed into a subject like human evolution uh, through the advanced science, science or life sciences degrees, and particularly majoring in biological science or earth science. Just to finish, um, I want to play for you a 30 second promo. So um, I'll pause this Hi. one. Oopsie, too quick. Um, so essentially, um, I've been working with UNSW TV writing and presenting a new series that is in fact pitched at 15 year olds and we've quite deliberately targeted um, the school audience with this series. <clears throat> it's going to be launched next month, the first six episodes, and it's going to be available on the UNSW YouTube channel, but also the Australian Museum site, and it'll also be sent out to schools across New South Wales through the museum's Museum in a Box program. Hi, I'm Darren Turner, evolutionary biologist and host of How Did We Get Here? It's all about what it is to be human today and where we've come from. Did you ever stop to wonder about that? Why are our bodies built the way they are? How similar are we to our great ape cousins? Why are we the only species to cook food? Are we evolutionary master chefs? What did the arrival of farming 10,000 years ago mean for the human race? And on that topic, a race is real anyway. So subscribe to this new science series where we take apart myths about evolution and what it means to be human. Okay, I'll leave it there. Thank you very much. Thank you, Darren. Um, I'm now going to invite Vanessa Dawson from the um, UNSW Canberra at ADFA campus, um, who's here to talk to you a little bit about the recruitment process for um, ADFA at the Australian Defence Force Academy. Um, and I will find your slide here in a moment, and I haven't started your clock yet, so don't worry. Go. Oh, good morning, everybody. Um, I'm here today just to give you a really brief overview and really talk about the dual admission process to the Australian Defence Force Academy. Obviously, two parts to it. There's the university application process and the Defence Force recruiting process. Now, I'm just going to show you a really short video. It's a couple of minutes. This is a Defence Force recruiting promotional video um, which talks about ADFA.
Okay, so it's as easy as that, three years at ADFA, just like that. Sorry about that. Um, on that video too, you may have noticed that there were circles that came up. Um, the, it is an interactive um, video, so if your students are interested, they can go on to Defence Jobs website um, and they can stop that video at different points and it gives them further information. Okay, so um, this is the mission and charter. I'm not really going to go through this um, in too much detail. Really just the main point is that the Australian Defence Force Academy is the pathway, the beginning pathway to a career in the Australian Defence Force. The students are lucky enough to come to ADFA and Defence Force is then saying we will sponsor you and pay for your undergraduate degree, which is fantastic because they get a degree from UNSW. Um, but the first decision that these young people need to make is that they are joining the Australian Defence Force. Um, just the unique things about the Australian Defence Force Academy, it is a tri-service environment, so Navy, Army and Air Force all together, which is quite unique. Um, overseas, most of those institutions tend to be single service only. Um, great for the learning of those young officer cadets and midshipmen. Um, and it, the university education obviously is provided by UNSW, which is also quite unique. Um, overseas, that education is generally provided by the military. Okay, so UNSW Canberra is obviously the third campus of UNSW. Um, we have about a thousand and just over a thousand undergraduate students who are all members of the Australian Defence Force. We also have about 1,800 postgraduate students um, and anyone can study postgraduate with us. All our postgraduates now online um, by distance um, and we do have a very large proportion of military um, personnel who study postgraduate with us as well. Now, because we're a small campus, we have a lot of benefits, but one of the main benefits of our um, lovely campus is that our student-staff ratio currently sits at about nine to one, which is amazing. So for every nine students, we have one academic staff member. Now, that's great for our students. Our academic staff know our students by name, good or bad, they can chase them down, um, but they can provide assistance wherever needed at any time. Because of that, the progression rate, and that's the rate at which our undergraduates progress through their degree program, uh, currently sits at about 95%. Um, and the GO8, which is the group of eight average, of which um, UNSW is a member, is at, currently sits at about 85%. Okay, so the undergraduate programs that we offer at UNSW Canberra, we don't have the breadth of programs that we offer at our main campus. Our programs are all in line with the jobs that they are filling um, for the Defence Force. So you can see there are three-year programs. We have Arts and Science, and they're the majors within those programs that the students can study. Business program is a three-year program, very structured. It's a generalist business degree, um, but they don't get much choices to the subjects that they study within that program. Informa uh, IT, Information Technology, three-year degree is also quite structured. Um, and then we have our two technology degrees. This degree program is being brought in for primarily for pilots. Um, aeronautical is the first three years of an aeronautical engineering degree, which many of our pilots choose to do. Pilots can't do engineering just due to the timing. Um, so they often do that aeronautical technology. Later on, they can do a further 12-month study and articulate that engineering qualification. And then technology aviation. We then have the four types of engineering that we offer, which is a four-year honours degree, civil, mechanical, electrical, and aeronautical. Okay, so this is also unique, although maybe changing, I'm not sure, um, for UNSW generally. Um, but UNSW Canberra, each year the minimum ATAR requirement is set. So these are the minimum ATARs that are required for those different degree programs for 2016 entry. You can see there what they are, I'm not going to go through those. Um, but they are set now, so the student knows exactly what they need to get for the university side of the admission process. Okay, so it is a dual admission process, as I mentioned at the beginning. There are two parts to it. The first part is a Defence Force recruiting process. Basically, the students are going through a Defence Force recruiting process to get a job offer for the Australian Defence Force um, through ADFA. 
Um, and what ADFA is, is producing junior officers or leaders for the Australian Defence Force. So you can see there's a number of steps on the left hand side there in that Defence Force recruiting process. So we generally advise students to start that process when they're in year 11. So if students can start in year 12, um, but because there are a number of steps, sometimes it can become really quite stressful and tricky if they're doing their year 12 exams and trying to get through that Defence Force recruiting process. The second part of the process is they need to, like for any other university, put an application in UAC and reach our minimum tertiary entrance requirement for the degree that they wish to do at UNSW Canberra. They do that the year prior to entry to ADFA on the, on the, for the UAC process. Um, and because they do need that defence job offer as well, um, we don't defer or anything. So they can only put that, it's only worthwhile putting their university application in the year prior to entry to ADFA. They can't have one without the other. So they have to have a Defence Force job offer for ADFA and then they have to meet the minimum tertiary entrance requirement for UNSW Canberra. As long as they have a Defence Force job offer and they meet our minimum requirement, they won't be knocked out by someone with a higher ATAR because basically our supply and demand is set through that Defence Force recruiting process. Oh, sorry, <laughs> gone too far. Um, so I'll be around at lunch, so happy to answer any questions. Um, I think you've got guides in your packs for UNSW Canberra which have my contact details. It is a fairly rigorous and confusing process for our potential students for ADFA, so please give me a call at any time, happy to help. Thank you. Excellent, thank you Vanessa. So Vanessa mentioned that the um, UNSW Canberra ADFA guide will be in the suite of guides that you'll get um, just before lunch. They're at your um, seats for lunch, so you will have access to those um, once you get up to Leighton Hall for lunch um, just after one o'clock this afternoon. Um, I'd now like to introduce uh, our Deputy Vice Chancellor Academic Professor Ian Martin, um, who is here to chat with you about an exciting announcement that we have today um, about something called guaranteed entry here at UNSW. It's being introduced today. Um, we have Shez and Sophie and Stacy and Emma who are going to come down and hand out our hot off the presses guaranteed entry publication, um, which you'll have access to um, now. Um, and uh, these will be available for download shortly as well. Um, guaranteed entry is our way of being the most transparent university in New South Wales, and we are proud of what we're about to announce here. So without further ado, I will hand over to our Deputy Vice Chancellor Academic, Professor Ian Martin. Thank you. Thanks very much, Jonathan. Um, firstly, it's my pleasure to welcome you here today. Um, the, future schools, uh, the future students team sit within my portfolio, and it's great to have the opportunity to talk to you and welcome you to the university. As has just been said, what I want to do is to explain what in some ways is a communication change to our future students, but in other ways is actually part of our ongoing commitment to try and make the process to come to UNSW more transparent and easier for people to understand what the requirements and expectations are up front. So what we've decided is that we want to move to a position where we can say to students ahead of time, if you achieve this across just about all of our degree programs, we will guarantee you a place at university. So trying to make it a lot more transparent up front. So to remove for the majority of students that am I going to get above the cut mark or am I not in January? We think, although it's a minor change in some ways, it's actually an important statement that we want to be transparent with our student body. We want to say to them, this is what we want to do. So I'll come on to some details in a minute, but essentially what we will be putting out publicly is for the vast majority of our degree programs, I'll explain why we haven't done it for some in a minute and that there are very good reasons for that, but the vast majority, we will say to students, if you achieve this entry score, we will guarantee you a place in that program at UNSW for 2016. The entry score is the combination of the raw ATAR rank plus any bonus points you might get awarded. And I know for many of our students, they get very confused between ATAR an entry score, as do many of our own staff. But we're talking about the entry score, not the raw ATAR, and I think that's really important to emphasize. So what we're saying 
is we will guarantee you, if you get a, an entry score, ATAR plus bonus points of that, you will have a place at UNSW. That will go out publicly now. We absolutely will honour that. We've been working in over the last two years to get more transparent around what we're doing, to better understand the student demand for our programs. So we feel we can do this with confidence and add value to the admissions process. So I'm not going to go through what is a railway timetable. You've got it handed out. It's in the document. But essentially, what you will see in the document for all of our faculty programs, a table that has four columns, the degree name, the UAC code, the entry score cutoff that we had in 2015, again to give people an idea of where we sat in 2015, and then the score at which we will guarantee a place in that program for 2016. And we've done that pretty much for all of the programs except those where there are additional parameters that you take into consideration. And on this slide, you can see in arts and social sciences, if you look at the music degrees, for instance, you need an audition to do a music program. So we can't do the guarantee around anything where you are looking at an audition, a portfolio, or for medicine where you combine a measure of academic performance, ATAR plus interview plus UMAT test. So pretty much for everything else, there is a guaranteed entry score there for students coming here for next year. What that means is that... Students will still get their substantive offer as part of the UAC round in January, but they will receive communication from us as soon as we know the results that they have a guaranteed place here. It's not an offer, but it is a letter that we will honour as a guaranteed place. And we're going to do that across the board, and that will start from this year. So most of the differences in the table between last year's entry rank and the guaranteed entry score are very small indeed. We've actually worked very closely with um, the faculties and we're, we're very confident now as to what standards are going to be required. So that's what we're hoping to do. We're not hoping to do, that's what we are going to do. And as I say, in some ways it's a small change, but in other ways it's actually quite a major change to try and add some clarity to the process for students. So I'm not going to go into any more detail, but I, I thought it was important that we announce this today so that you're aware of it. The table's there, it will be publicly available through documents and our website from today. And the team will be very happy to answer questions about this later on the day, and I'm very happy to take questions now. So, um, any questions? Yeah, come on. Um, my ID? ID? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. same applies. <laughs> Yes. Alone, not a conversion to ATAR. And so I think we're working on that, that conversion to ATAR part. This is going to be, at the moment, and this may change later this year, yes. but at the moment, it's going to be based on your ID converted to ATAR, not a separate table. Yes. Will that change? It may, but at the moment, it's based on conversion to ATAR. Yeah. I know that's not what you were hoping to hear. Yeah. yeah. But it will be a consistent table, and it will be upfront. So again, it will say IB score of 37 equals ATAR of 90-something, and that will translate to the guaranteed entry score. So it will be very much up front. Yes. So if you, if you fall in the grey area between um, sort of where we would set the cutoff and the guaranteed, offers will still go out, and that's made very clear in the documentation. For most of our degree programmes in this list, you'll see the band is actually really very narrow indeed between where we put the cutoff last year, or this year, and where we will go next year. Indeed, for many of them, it's exactly the same number. And that's because we've worked with you and your colleagues and we actually got a pretty good idea of demand. But yes, there will still be offers in that, that middle band. And students will be notified 
Yeah, yeah, yes, yes. They call to load the guarantee font with their selection rights. Um, will, the letter they will receive from the university around the 18th of December will include a saying, you may still be competitive because you are within the gap between the cutoff of the previous year and the guarantee that you yeah. are. Yeah, and if I could just add to that, I think we've had really quite stable ATARs across, or entry scores across the institution now for the last two years. In counselling your students, I would say to them that whilst there might be fluctuations of half or one point in many of the scores, we don't anticipate seeing much difference in those in the, the, the sort of what the, the bottom might be or the, the range for the next few years. We know school leaver population at the moment is pretty much flat. So I think in terms of counselling students, what's in there for 2015 is likely to be very, very close to where we land in 2016. Yes. Basically, it's got to be on the list, and to get the offer through the UAC system, you will get the UAC offer. So we could guarantee you a place, but if you haven't got that one as the first in your UAC list, UAC will automatically send your first offer out to the first eligible program in the list. So this is a confusion that's created because of the UAC system and the fact that you get the offer to the first one in the list. And you don't mind where it is. We don't mind where it is, but the students need to be aware that if that one isn't the top, the, the offer won't come from us because of the nature of the UAC system. It's also the point that, and in point number two, it's that it is UAC main round only. So yes. guaranteed entry applies to the main round only, and that is where that, I understand the confusion, but that, that's the yes. part of it. Main yeah. round can and then has to be your highest level. Yeah. Yes? Um, can you publish a for the ESO? We cannot, no, because of the defense court security process. Yes. So that's why we have not published yeah. Um, well, we do publish. So yeah, the, the ATAR. Area, yeah, I can. The yeah, the cut. The, the raw ATAR cutoff is publicly available, um, and it, that list is there. And I'm r recalling that for the bulk of them, it's a raw ATAR of 75, plus the recruitment bonus points that you get from the officer recruitment process. And for engineering, it's 80 something. 85. So those are the minimum. So that's yes. not a guaranteed entry mark. It's the yes. minimum yeah. required. Yeah. But the issue with ADFA is we can't do guaranteed entry for ADFA because you've just heard we will guarantee a place in our programs to officer cadets that meet the Defence Force selection criteria and the minimum academic standards, which means we're out, out, we don't have control over the first part of that. So you, yeah. oh. yeah, that that's parked at the moment. There's more more discussion around any changes to our law entry at the moment. So if there is changes, we'll let you know. But certainly for 2016, it is status quo. So as a hand came up here, no. There is possibility that in the future we may change, but we have a commitment that we will honour and continue to honour, at least while I hold this role, that we will not change bonus points without a two-year notice period, so that students who are going into year 11, at the beginning of year 11, will know what it is at the end of the process. We continue to look at our bonus points, because what we want to do is to make sure that they actually reflect measures that cumulatively and legitimately add to your ATAR rank score to decide entry. We'll continue to refine that. It may change. There may be some tweaking at the edges as we get better experience of what we're doing. 
Um, for instance, the HSC Plus bonus points, we know that they're working well in some areas. We may want to uh, look at how we use those. I mean, no plans, but I can guarantee you we won't change it without two years' notice. Essentially, if a student, and I, and I think basically if a student meets the guaranteed entry score and they change their preferences, we will honour that guaranteed entry score. And I'm looking to Jonathan to make sure that logistically I, I can say that, but that's certainly my intent. It's just that they won't, they may not receive, they'll receive one letter around the 18th of December as soon as all of their bonus points are, are we're able to know what those are. And EAS might be the only ones that are, for some students, uncertain because of the a late application or otherwise. Um, but otherwise, if they change their preferences, there's a, an FAQ that addresses that exact same question. What if I um, still I change my preferences after I receive my guaranteed letter? As long as your selection rank, your ATAR plus your bonus points and your selection rank is at or above the guaranteed entry, you have a guaranteed entry. You just might not have a letter yeah. that proves it. Yeah. Um, and we know that will generate some questions, but it isn't a massive number of students who make a huge range of changes. Um, they reorder, possibly, but they don't generally completely change 100% on um, their preferences. Yes. And it meets the other criteria and you send them the letter and you send the time you've got guaranteed entry. Yes. Will that letter also include other degrees for which they can get guaranteed entry if they then include that as a preference before the end of the first week of January? It wasn't our intention to do that. Um, we can point them in the direction, we could, I mean, You've, we can easily put in the letter week that, but, uh, that point them to the website, but we wouldn't be able to list out because for some people, that list might be uh, 30, 40 options. So the plan is not to do that. And I think the, we will, the letter that they receive will include whether they've met the guaranteed entry requirement for every UNSW preference that they've expressed with their one yes. preferences. If they fall below the guaranteed entry but above the minimum cutoff of any one of those degrees, we may also tell them hey, have you thought about that you're still, com still competitive and are you aware of these other degree options as well that yeah. you might consider as a backup or a plan B as well? So those students would receive some additional advice. But the guaranteed entry students would receive one for every UNSW preference, uh, one letter indicating for all of their UNSW preferences. Any other comments? If not, I think. Okay. Good. Well, thank you very much indeed. So. Thank you, Ian. Well, thank, thank you. you very much, and uh, hope you enjoy the rest of the day. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Thanks very much. So what we'll do at this point, um, I imagine that there's going to be a fair bit of questions that you'll have as this will settle in. Um, and so please be, feel free to ask questions at any point between um, during the break that we have coming up shortly um, and or over lunch. All of our UNSW staff have been briefed on guaranteed entry. They're, they're fully aware of how it's going to work. We have some details to work out in terms of how those letters will be, what those letters will exactly say and what the advice to those students will be. But we will do that in advance and you'll be aware of what's being uh, told, the, what they're being told as well. Um, so that's guaranteed entry. Please, again, feel free to ask any other questions later today. Um, I'd now like to introduce Associate Professor Kath Ellis, um, who's the Associate Dean of Education for the Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences, um, who's here to talk about the UNSW Bachelor of Arts. Um, and so without further ado, Kath Ellis. Good morning, everybody. As Jonathan said, my name is Kath Ellis. I'm the Associate Dean for Education in the Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences. And I'm going to talk to you a little bit today about our BA. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to start with an activity. And Stacey is coming around and passing around little books of sticky notes. So if you could take one sticky note from these books and pass them on, what I'd like is for everybody to have a sticky note, just one sticky note in front of them and a pen poised, ready to answer my question. Now, what I would like you to do, when I put the question up on the screen, 
is I would like you to write a simple one-word answer to my question, which is either yes or no. Okay? And I want you to do so honestly. I want you to be brutally honest with yourself. We're going to gauge the responses, but I can guarantee you at this point that your response will be completely anonymous. Nobody will know what your response to this question has been. So I really want you to answer honestly. If you are yet to have a sticky note in front of you, can you wave your arms in the air like you just don't care? And a sticky note will find its way to you. Thank you very much. Okay, so reminder, everybody should have one sticky note. If you wind up with the remnant book of sticky notes, consider it a gift. <laughs> We're very generous here in the Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences. Um, pen poised, ready, and here is the question, and I want it to be an honest answer of either yes or no. Do you advise students against doing a Bachelor of Arts because of its career outcomes? Yes or no? Once you've answered that, you need to then stick this sticky note to your finger so it waves in the air like a little flag and pass it to somebody else and pass it to somebody else, and pass it to somebody else again, and again, and backwards and forwards and across, and backwards and forwards and across. And once you stop, <laughs> and I'll say stop. OK, you should now have a sticky note that you have absolutely no idea where it's come from, so you don't know whose answer that is. Can you wave your sticky note in the air if the answer is yes? Ah. So some of you, a very small number, are saying that you do advise students against doing a Bachelor of Arts because of its career outcomes. Hand up with a sticky note on it if the answer is no. Right. Thank you. You're warming the very cockles of my heart. <laughs> Now, just to test if you've been good students, does anybody have a word on their sticky note that's not yes or no? <laughs> bad person, bad person, whoever these people. I know it wasn't you two, it was somebody else, but bad student. Sometimes. Ah, okay, all right, sometimes. Would I be right in thinking that whoever wrote those don't have to own up to it, that sometimes it depends on the student, maybe? Okay, well, my job here today I'm not going to tell you about the structure of the BA. I'm not going to tell you about our majors and minors. I think you know all of that information. It's all on the website. What I want to do today is explore this issue to do with career outcomes, because what I want to do is convince you that the evidence suggests the exact opposite of this, that in fact we should be advising students to do the BA because of its career outcomes. Why is that? It's because the world of work is changing. Now, the world of work has always been changing. Let's not kid ourselves, OK? But it's changing more rapidly and in new ways. And we need to be aware of these things. Jobs are disappearing. Now, when I was an undergraduate student, and I guess when many of you were undergraduate students, there were such things as research librarians. Do you remember them? They were lovely people. <laughs> they don't exist anymore. There are no such things as research librarians in university libraries anymore. They just don't exist. But back when I was an undergraduate student, if you'd said to me that we're looking to employ a social marketing expert, I would have had absolutely no idea what you meant. And even five years ago, we wouldn't have known what that meant. Jobs are disappearing and jobs are appearing at a much faster rate than they ever have done before. There's been a very interesting survey saying that some of the most common job titles on LinkedIn weren't there five years ago. But it's not just changing once within a, somebody's career lifespan now, it's changing several times. And in a recent labour mobility survey released by the Australian Bureau of Statistics in 2013, it was found that less than half of the Australian working population had been in their jobs for more than five years. 56% were in their job for less than five years and 20% had been in their jobs for less than 12 months. People are changing jobs and jobs are changing much more rapidly than they did in the past. So the idea that once upon a time you got a university degree that qualified you for a career and you did that career for life, those days are very much over. But also working habits are changing. Millennials are changing. They are changing the way that they work. The sorts of jobs that are available and the sort of work that is available is much more in the work of freelancing, consultancy, events, projects, what's called gig work going from one gig to another. And I spoke to one of our amazing new master's students yesterday, who's just come, he worked in animation, he did a lot of work on Happy Feet 2, 
And he said, when you're working, you're coming home at 8, 9 o'clock, and that's no family life, which is why he's come to do a master's in secondary teaching. Again, warming the cockles of our hearts. But he said, there were periods of time when I was working till 8, 9, 10 o'clock at night, and then there were periods of time when I was home all the time. That was great for my family life, but that's very common kind of work now. You do intensive project work, and then you're unemployed for a period of time. But millennials are changing as well. They're proving to be more nomadic, more resilient, and more comfortable with change than previous generations. They've experienced long periods of economic uncertainty, and so they're used to needing to have a backup plan, um, backup options, and, and a lot of them also have entrepreneurial activities that back them up in case their main job goes sour. So part-time work, entrepreneurial activities on the side. Millennials are much more agile in their world of work than any generation has been before them. So why does that matter for the BA? Well, our role as educators is to prepare graduates for this world of work, not just to train them for jobs, but prepare them to survive, but also thrive in this new environment. We need to be thinking about what graduate employers are telling us. And they are telling us that they are much less interested in qualifications. The fact that a student has a BA doesn't really distinguish a graduate from another graduate anymore because so many students have these qualifications. They're much more interested in the skills that that student can evidence and demonstrate. Rob Dyer, who's head of graduate recruitment at Deloitte in the UK, explained why they're interested in recruiting graduates from outside the fields of finance and accounting. And he said, if they've studied history, their research skills give them a huge boost. They're self-starters. They're used to going away, studying on their own and coming back with a view. These are important skills for us. So even companies like Deloitte are interested in arts graduates because of these skills that they are finding come from the BA and not necessarily from finance or accounting degrees. So here we are distinguishing between preparing students for employment and preparing students for employability. So what's more interesting to graduate employers than their qualification and the skills is the story that those students can tell about themselves, their passions, their interests, and their aspirations. That's why we're focusing in the BA in the coming years on developing a career development education strategy. All of you will be familiar with CDE, I know, because that's your world of work. It will support students as they gather together and provide hard evidence for the skills they've got and acquired, but also guide them to develop the narratives around those skill sets so that they can tell the story to graduate employers, to start-up funders, to crowd funders, about, and venture capitalists, to, and make sure that that story is a compelling one but also an evidenced one. So where once a qualification itself gave graduates an edge over those without qualifications, in this different knowledge economy and, frankly, in the knowledge democracy, what becomes important is distinctiveness. And that's what makes the difference, making sure that you can tell a story that is compelling because it makes you suited to a very particular role. Graduate employers are therefore less interested in what students know and much more interested in how they think or even whether or not they can think at all. And I would argue that a BA gives you those credentials in a way that a lot of other degrees don't. And here's some genuine stories of our current students and alumni who are demonstrating this. On the left, you have Rihanna, who's one of our current students. She came in absolutely certain she was going to become an actor. She started doing some work with schools, with the drama and theatre and performance team. Suddenly, she got the passion for teaching. We know that passion, don't we? And now she's decided that she's going to change direction and she's going to train as a teacher rather than as an actor. In the middle, we've got Charlie Cox. He was absolutely into film and French when he was here. He went to everything to do with film and everything to do with French. He went to film societies. He was at um, film uh, uh, events. Anything to do with the French Film Festival, he was there. He went on exchange to France. He did an internship with SBS. Now he is their programming executive for film at SBS because of that passion that he was able to pursue. And Lachlan Harris is another one of our alumni. He's a little further on in his um, career than the other two are. 
but he actually did politics with us and worked for a long time as the press secretary to Prime Minister Kevin Rudd, but is now, we can't really give him a job title because he kind of does everything. He is an entrepreneur, but also a communicator, and he's responsible for setting up one big switch. Now, I've had the pleasure of meeting Lachlan. His passion for what the BA can do in terms of equipping students with the skills needed to be able to take risk is absolutely infectious, and he puts it all down to his arts degree, not to his law degree. So that's all well and good about the BA, but how does that relate to us as a university? What makes us and our BA distinct? Well, at UNSW, we are a forward-looking institution. We're interested in looking at the problems that this generation are going to have to tackle, and these are problems that we would call wicked problems. These are problems like uh, disease pandemic, the status of the fourth world, indigenous people, war uh, and uh, gender related violence. These are the sorts of questions and problems that haven't been able to be solved yet and we need fresh new ways of thinking about this. We are a research active group of eight universities so we have teachers working with our undergraduate students who are asking the difficult questions, and indeed asking questions that nobody has ever thought to ask before. And that's what we want to reward in our students, not just that they can provide us with the right answers, but they can ask the right questions, even if we don't yet know what those answers are. And this is what we feel we do in the BA. We act as a kind of prism, and it works in two directions. You know those scattergun students who are blazing and they absolutely want to solve all the problems of the world? I've seen them in our lecture theatres all week. It's O week. They're amazing. You know, they just can't wait to get started. Can we stop with all this welcoming stuff? I want to get down to work, said one of them to me. What we like to be able to do is... They do, honestly, it happened. It was bizarre, but anyway, it happened. Um, <laughs> We like to take these scattergun students and use the degree to focus them into that white hot laser beam that can really cut through and make a difference. But we often have students going in the other direction. We have students thinking, yes, I definitely want to be an actor, but actually something triggers, something pushes a button in them and suddenly they spread. They want to be an actor and a teacher. And what I've been seeing in these O-Week lectures is not just our first years blazing and bright, but our third years and fourth years coming back and talking to those students in O-Week to welcome them. And the difference between the two is amazing to behold because those students are assured, they're confident, they're not completely focused yet, but my goodness, they've got that sense of that heat starting to develop. And that has been a truly inspiring experience for me this week. I'm gonna to come to lunch today. I'm a BA graduate myself, so I can handle it. Tackle me, come and talk to me, challenging me on what I've said today. You know, test me on what I'm asserting here today. Come and talk to me at lunch. I'd love you to challenge me. I did politics, I can take it. Uh, <laughs> lovely to meet you all and have a lovely day. Thank you, Kath. I am also a BA person, so um, I would love to engage in that discussion. Um, so we are taking a 12-minute break. Um, so please feel free to 12 minuteize your time and be back here within 12, well, really, 11 and a half minutes. Thank you. Excellent, ready to go for our last three presentations. Next, we have Mr. Andrew Rowe from the UNSW Business School here to talk about um, the international, international and global opportunities available from and for students within the UNSW Business School. So without further ado, Andrew. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jonathan. It is uh, a pleasure to be here today. Uh, thank you all of you for, for coming and welcome to UNSW. Um, I work at the Business School. My title is the Manager of International Projects. Uh, just to relate to the previous speaker, my undergraduate was a Bachelor of Arts as well, so I'm happy to endorse graduates who have a Bachelor of Arts. Uh, I'll just give you a few pieces of information about the business school. Uh, overall, if you're not aware of it, we uh, offer an, a whole range of courses across undergraduate, postgraduate research and coursework. Um, we also have the AGSM, which delivers our flagship MBA program. Uh, we also deliver really good quality executive education. Um, within the school, we have eight disciplinary schools, we have nine research centres, we're quite a large faculty with over 12,000 students, um, 357 academics, 
um, and we have over 75,000 alumni throughout the world. Uh, my role is really about international engagement um, and in particular encouraging our students to, as part of their degree, get an international experience. So really pushing them to get offshore and we've got a whole range of experiences which I'm going to tell you a bit about. Um, first though, I thought I would just show you a little video, hopefully this one does work. So I think that video really captures uh, what it is that we're trying to do when we promote international education. It's not just about the professional aspect of getting that experience overseas, it's also about the personal benefits that our return students, uh, th that they can, they can tell us that they've experienced, that they've grown. And I've got a couple of attributes that um, employers actually uh, perceive, that people who've returned from an international experience have these skills um, and they've developed them over time overseas. Just a couple of quotes there. Again, this is uh, on the, the personal aspect. Um, and I personally am quite passionate about this, the, the personal benefits that people experience from having that overseas uh, experience while they're at UNSW and the business school. So studies over time have shown us what these benefits are. Um, the academic benefits, the career benefits. Employers have, there's a list of characteristics that employers associate with returned students. Um, adaptability, initiative, maturity, cultural awareness, leadership qualities, a global perspective, confidence, interpersonal skills, et cetera, et cetera. Now obviously they can be developed in a number of ways, but we promote those as benefits of the international experience. Um, exposure to different study environments, cost and time effective, um, the cultural experience obviously, which is very hard to replicate in any other environment. I promise it won't be death by PowerPoint, but here's the bullet points on some of, some of the uh, academic research which has shown the, the uh, long-term studies, um, the international skills of graduates. Again, some of these can be developed in other ways, but we promote international education as a way of gaining all of these skills. Uh, just out of interest, the University of New South Wales, 20.8%, uh, or just under 21% of our graduates have an international experience at the point of graduation. Um, and at the Australian University's International Directors Forum, um, that benchmark was the highest percentage. I believe last year was the first time that UNSW reached that. Um, so there's been a huge push across each of our faculties and at the international office level to get our students overseas. So, I've talked a bit about the reasons why students should go, but why don't they go? What are the obstacles? And part of my role is to look at those obstacles and, and try and break them down. Uh, money is a big one, and I'm going to talk about these two aspects in particular, OS Help and the new Colombo plan. Time away from home is also a big one. And a need or a perceived need to focus on the degree. Why should I waste time going overseas when I can belt out my degree and get into the workforce sooner rather than later. So in terms of money, um, some of you may have heard about OS Help. So the Australian government is really behind the same initiatives that, that we are as a university and that is getting our students to go overseas but in particular to go to Asia and I'll come back to Asia in a few minutes. So OS Help uh, is, is similar to what used to be HECS, Fee Help and it allows students to borrow money 
to fund their experience overseas. Uh, you can borrow more money if you're going to Asia. So it's the current rate, $6,300 is a general limit, but if you're going to Asia, you can borrow up to $7,600. And this just accumulates on a fee help debt. So it's, it's helping overcome that barrier. Um, and you also get, if you're studying a language in Asia, you get an extra $1,000 that you can access through this funding mechanism. So that's one way that we're trying to show students you don't have to, this is not about people who can uh, afford the airfare. You can actually borrow this money, you can pay it back to the government at the same way you would pay back your fee help. Time away from home. So we have found that a lot of students, uh, if you're going for six months a semester overseas, you quit the part-time job, you give up your lease, all of those things, um, and it's, it's too much of a commitment for some. So we have found that short courses of two to six weeks that can be done over the winter and summer breaks are actually quite appealing, and in particular to get students to head to Asia. Again, I'll come back to that in a future slide. You can spend up to two semesters overseas, and we have um, uh, Bachelor of Commerce International where our students to complete that degree program have to spend two semesters overseas. They can be at different locations. Uh, need to focus on your degree. We have a whole range of options and when we promote these to students we emphasise the credit component of that. So you're actually working towards your major, working towards your degree. It is not lost time. Um, obviously from a personal perspective there's a great deal of benefit but even from an academic perspective you get to experience a new academic system um, and gain credit towards your degree back here at UNSW. So student, student exchange, this is probably the most traditional and most well known of options to get overseas experience. Um, we as a university have over 200 partners around the world. Um, as I said you're enrolled at UNSW, the credit is counted towards the student's degree here. The business school, we have, um, I believe, the largest cohort of outbound students at the university. Um, most of these students, 239 uh, to 98 universities around the world, most of those would have been in their first semester of their final year of an undergraduate degree. So where did they go? I hope that one's clear enough. Um, you can see a very large circle there on the United States, uh, also Canada uh, and the United Kingdom generally scattered around Western Europe then, and a few dots in Asia. Uh, so most students, given the preference, will head to the United States. Um, and then, as I said, Canada and the UK come in uh, close second and third. What we are trying to do is encourage students to consider Asia as an option, as a destination. Obviously, you've all heard about the, um, the Australian government's white paper. Uh, the new Colombo plan, which you may have heard referenced as well, is a, a government initiative to encourage our students to get experience, particularly in Asia. You have to be going to an Asian destination to receive funding under the new Colombo plan. New Colombo plan has two streams. Uh, one is for individual scholarships, and they can be up to $67,000, I think. Um, and the amount that you receive depends on the destination that you're going to. It's a highly competitive process, but again, the focus is on getting students into Asia. Um, the other aspect of the new Colombo plan funds group mobility projects, and I run a couple of those, and I'll talk to you about those in a second, where we can send a group of students short-term into Asia. We do work-integrated learning programs with them, and they're really beneficial to those students who can't commit to spending a semester or more overseas. This is why we want to get our students into Asia. These are Australia's current export statistics. And that's as of now. By 2030, 80% of our exports will be into Asia. Obviously, free trade agreements, the integration of ASEAN, the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, these things are only going to increase that trend. So the chances are if you've got a, a person born in Australia today, by the time they reach working age, they will be working for an Asian company or with an Asian company, selling into Asia, buying from Asia. They need to understand the Asian business environment and increasingly uh, we need to expose our students to the Asian cultural environment. And I don't mean that as one homogenous block. There are obviously various differences between those countries, but we need to get our students to understand those things better than we currently do. So the global business practicum uh, is one thing we have done to meet these objectives. Again, it's for credit, and this is an intensive course. So what we do is we send students to these destinations listed down the bottom here, Jakarta, Hong Kong, Bangkok, Tianjin, that's this year and in the last six months of last year. 
we send across a cohort of about 20 students and we split those students into small groups of three to five and they are placed with a company for that period and they work on a problem or an issue that that company has. It's a real world issue. Uh, we're not looking for companies who kind of invent some kind of research paper. So we've had students looking at, for example, there's a new free trade zone in Shanghai and we've had a, an Australian bank getting our students to research what are the opportunities that uh, that opens up for them. Um, we've had another company looking at a market entry strategy for, for rail maintenance in Indonesia, uh, marketing campaigns for a new domestic air route in Indonesia. So these are real workplace situations um, and the students go over for three to four weeks, as I say, they're getting both the work integrated learning plus the credit and that international experience. So this is, this is kind of our flagship program in that, in that arena. Uh, the feedback so far has been pretty good. Uh, we ran the pilot last year in Jakarta and we're expanding the capacity now this year to be able to take about 80 students overseas on this particular program. I think the last line there is probably of relevant, that's not something you experience in a classroom. So it's that, that added dimension that we're trying to add to this course. So these are some of our, some of our students who went to Jakarta last year. Um, that's the Australian ambassador to Indonesia, uh, Greg Moriarty, in the middle there. Um, as I say, that was our pilot program. So when we send the students over, it's not just about the business aspect, as I say. We also have a number of social and cultural events and, and obviously we were lucky enough to be able to get the ambassador to, to have dinner with the students. Another course that we've run that we've also just set up recently and ran our pilot um, just this January is the Social Entrepreneurship Practicum. So it's the same uh, structure in the sense that it's for credit. It's an intensive four-week program. Um, it happens in an overseas location generally, and in January this happened um, in a village uh, outside Bangalore in uh, Karnataka. So this program was based on students going into a village and with the skills and resources available locally, coming up with a sustainable business idea. Uh, so this gives them grass level understanding of how small scale economies work, um, and this is fundamental to understanding how business works in, in parts of Asia. So just a few other opportunities just to list things that we do. I mentioned that we're breaking, trying to break down barriers, uh, things that stop students from getting that overseas experience. Um, one thing that the research has shown is that if a student goes early in their academic career on an overseas experience, when they come back, they will seek out another opportunity, they will seek out a longer term opportunity, and they won't necessarily stick to the, the safer destinations of, of Europe and, and North America. And when I say safe, I mean the traditional destinations for student exchange. Um, so this year we're running a new pilot um, where we're going to take 10 first year students who started this week at UNSW. They haven't been identified yet and they don't know it yet because we haven't promoted this to them. And we're gonna take them to Shanghai. So literally within four or five months of starting at UNSW, they will be sitting doing the uh, anti-college of economics and management summer school, one of the best universities in Asia, Shanghai Jia Tong. Um, they will learn about Chinese business, culture and language. And our hope is that, that that will then break down the barrier to them doing a longer term exchange in another Asian destination. The Confucius Institute, uh, you may or may not be aware, UNSW has a Confucius Institute, recently won an award for uh, the best in the world. I forget what the title of the actual award was. Um, they run two study tour options for our students, paid for uh, by the Chinese government, Chinese Department of Education, Ministry of Education, pays for the on-ground costs, so no accommodation, transport costs while students are on the ground. Um, we run two of those a year, one to Xi'an and one to Shanghai. Uh, Achichis is the, let me get this one out, the Australian Consortium for In-Country Indonesian Studies. Um, and there are 14 Australian universities as part of this network and we send students for semester exchange into Indonesia under this program. Um, and obviously we have various competitions and conferences that run. I think that's my alarm telling me I'm just about out of time. Um, I know there was a lot to get through there. If you have any further questions, um, I will be at lunch if I'm still invited. Uh, there will be some of my colleagues from the business school. If I can do a quick plug, if you are interested in finding out more about the business school, we are uh, a leading research house in the Asia Pacific. We have a publication that you can sign up to online. It's called Business Think, and that will keep you informed of all of the leading research that we're conducting at the business school. So thank you for your time. Hope to see you over lunch. Cheers. Thank you.
Thank you, Andrew. Um, I'd now like to welcome up Hayden Smith with the Sun Swift, with the emphasis on the UNSW part, um, to deliver his TED talk on Sun Swift. Thank you much. Thanks, Jonathan. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, so what I want to talk to you a bit about today is, you know, obviously engineering is a big part of UNSW, but I want to share with you the, the kind of experience and the story behind engineering. You know, I have quite a story to tell here today. I won't take up too much of your time because I understand it's a long day. But my story is one of many. You know, there are roughly 10,000 students here in the UNSW engineering faculty, and it's, um, it's a pleasure to just be one of those many exciting stories. So firstly, I want to talk to you about cruise control. Now, when it comes to a car, cruise control is, you know, when you take your foot off the accelerator and your car, you know, coasts down the highway. But when it comes to our own lives, especially as young students, cruise control is more often than not our default setting. It's when the status quo becomes just too comfortable and the idea of challenging yourself is a little bit unconvincing. So my name's Hayden, as you saw. Uh, I'm a fourth year undergraduate software engineering student here at UNSW. And to me, the idea of cruise control is something that's been all too familiar to me. So before university, I kind of always saw uni as a symbol of liberal thought and action in the world. Um, but when I got here, it turned into, I guess, one of the more conservative platforms to delve into the things that inspired you. And I spent a large part of my degree on cruise control. You know, all I wanted to do was get some good marks, hopefully do well in my degree and eventually get a good job. And that's what university became. It became putting any aspirations I had on hold until I graduated, because until then, you know, I was just a student. But uh, then something changed. And in July last year, um, I led a team of about 30 students, and we broke a world record for the fastest electric vehicle over 500 kilometers. And now I feel a little bit different in regards to you know, cruise control and sitting around at university. <clears throat> so uh, I guess, where did this all start? You know, every good story has a beginning. And mine started in my first week of university. I met a man named Sam Patterson. And this guy was the leader of the solar car team he told me about called SunSwift. Uh, he told me that, you know, they build solar cars in their spare time, and as a self-respecting board first year in first week, um, I decided to go check it out. So I headed down to the workshop one Saturday. Um, the team had been around for about 16 years at this point, and they were building their fourth car. It was called Ivy. And he took me into the workshop, and it looked like this. Um, I mean, except flipped, obviously. Um, you know, it was a terrifying place. Uh, everything was everywhere. I didn't understand what was happening. And... He said, this is where we build solar cars. I couldn't believe it, given that, you know, I couldn't believe anyone would feel comfortable in this place, let alone competent enough to build a solar car. But he said, you know, let's go out the back, because the car wasn't in the workshop at the time. And he said, let's go actually check out the car. So he took me out the back to this rusting trailer that had dead branches on the top of it. Um, and he popped it open, and he showed me Ivy. Now, Ivy's the car before our current car. And at the time, Ivy was the... Guinness World Record holder for the fastest solar car anywhere on the planet. And it was right here at UNSW. You know, I'm from a small town in northeast New South Wales, and I can't believe something that you read in a Guinness Book of World Records was, like, right in front of me and you could touch it. But what blew my mind even more than, you know, this uh, world record-breaking car that they had was the fact that it was built by a bunch of, you know, rugged, underslept, poorly shaven engineers um, in a workshop out in the back of Randwick. But, you know, I did what most other students do when they see the solar car, is I turned around, you know, I went home. And, you know, went back to doing the usual things of first years. A few weeks later, I met some more people, uh, two guys called Peter and Chen. They came up to me and they said, uh, hey, you seem like a keen and interested guy. Would you like to help us start up a company? It's going to connect people who want to eat with people who are looking to cook, and we're going to call it Collaborate. And I said, man, this sounds exciting. You know, what could be better than a New South Innovations, you know, sponsored uh, startup company and be part of it? You know, and what was appealing was the idea of starting a business before you've even graduated from UNSW. Um, you know, the opportunity really existed. And more importantly, you had the chance to change how people ate, to change people's lives, which I thought was really quite incredible. But I did what most other students do, was I turned around and I went home. Um, and I didn't really want to get that involved because I went on cruise control. I was cruising along, you know, the university highway, just like all other Australian engineers, um, you know, collecting homework and handing in assignments. And, you know, that's, that's just part of the story. But what's really interesting is why I did that. 
And because if you're, if you're a student at university in Australia, you often hear these things all the time. You know, you can't do this because you're just a first year. You can't do this because you don't have experience yet. You can't do this because, you know, you're only a second year or a third year or something like that. And what it came back to was just a constant state of being told, and I'm not talking about by lecturers, but just society in general, um, you, you know, you really just can't do this. So then it came down to, you know, after a while, the question, uh, you know, question is, what if I could? You know, what if you could do this? What if you could, you know, do something awe inspiring and exciting and interesting and everything in between? Um, and I'm not talking about like page four of your resume cool, I'm talking about like world altering cool, that kind of stuff. What if you could start a company before completing introduction to business? Or what if you could build a solar car before completing introduction to electronics? I spent the first two years of university uh, doing a mixture between watching YouTube and playing table tennis. Um, now, like, don't get me wrong, it's probably, I'm sure you guys might remember similar days. Um, you know, it's some of the most fun you can possibly have with your life. But what I started to notice was that as I was looking on YouTube, uh, I started seeing my friends, you know, my UNSW friends. Uh, they were starting companies. They were, you know, winning awards. And most importantly to me, and what caught my eye, was they were building solar cars. And that's when I realized the, the question here, the problem here isn't really a lack of opportunity. I mean, UNSW Engineering, it's a faculty, I'm not trying to plug it, it's just, it's a faculty of 10,000 people, nine schools, um, more buildings than you could even imagine. And it's just not a lack of opportunity. What it really was was something I noticed with the culture is people were just a little bit conservative or afraid to get involved. And that's when I realized it's not about, you know, what if I could, it's about, you know, where can I start? And at the end of my second year, I, I joined SunSwift, um, one of, and SunSwift's one of about four student groups we have here in engineering that do some great work. And, you know, first I started off building their website, then I moved on and uh, helped trying to restructure their business team quite poorly. And eventually, after six months of hard work, I was leading the team. And next thing you know, it was July last year, and we were breaking this FIA world record with this car for the fastest electric vehicle over 500 kilometers anywhere in the world. It was a 26-year-old world record that was previously broken at 73 kilometers an hour, and we broke it at 107 kilometers an hour. Um, it's a real credit to everyone that's involved in this team and a real credit to the caliber of students that come here. But when it comes to breaking a world record, um, you know, start of stories again. Uh, this is somewhat, you know, it wasn't as easy as we expected it to be. Um, this was, you know, somewhat of our, we said, you know, we'll put some paperwork together, we'll chuck the car in the back of a trailer, um, we'll drive somewhere and see what happens. Five, uh, five or six months out, we had $40,000 to raise, you know, $40,000. And like, I know that's a lot of money to anyone, but half of our team lives at home with their parents and the other half of the team, like $40,000 is over three years of rent. So it's a terrifying prospect. And, you know, we talked to the faculty. They said, you guys don't have enough money. What are you doing? We talked to industry. They said, you guys don't have enough money. What are you doing? Um, but the thing is, fundraising is not a unique challenge, right? We're not the first group of people to ever need money. I'm, I'm sure of that. But what has always inspired me about the, the students here and being part of this kind of team is the way they respond to things, is that when we needed this money, they used to just put on suits and they'd head into the city in between lectures and tutorials. You know, we'd put the car in the city and we'd try and grab everyone working in the CBD down George Street in Martin Place. Um, and we'd try to establish some sponsorship agreements. And to all credit of these students, these guys, these guys are engineers, we're a team full of engineers. Um, you know, putting on suits, talking to businesses, we raised a bit under $100,000 last year, which helped fund a lot of what we were doing. You know, and again, it's a real credit to how well these programs really round these students. Um, the guy on the very left there, he's uh, head of our business team. I've never seen a more shrewd and um, seductive man when it comes to dealing with business-related things. <laughs> but uh, sometimes we had a few steeper learning curves than that. So the night before our last day of testing, which is kind of like the qualifying round, I guess, for the record attempt, it was 9 p.m. 11 hours out from testing, you know, we were packing up, we said, all right, time to go home, let's get a good night's rest. We thought we'd power on the car just to make sure everything's working. Um, we go to turn it on and nothing, it was dead silent. Now don't get me wrong, solar cars are meant to be quiet, that's one of the great parts about them, but you know, it didn't make a single sound. And we were terrified, you know, we thought our record attempt was over before we'd even started. Um, 
but you know, it's nine, 10 o'clock already. And again, another credit to these students here is that what happened was we, we called some up. We said, hey, can you guys come into the workshop? We had people coming in from and, uh, you know, Bankstown, um, out in the northwest near Castle Hill and that. They were coming in on buses, cars at the middle of the night, uh, late at night, trying to get the car fixed. We eventually found it was an electrical problem. And we, look, we were looking for this tool called a solder bath. Now it's something that just kind of joins complex um, electronics together. But we're looking for it, you know, it's midnight, it's one in the morning, it's two in the morning. We can't find it. And, you know, all of these guys, it's the middle of the holiday, so they're working full time, because, um, you know, they're all overachievers, these guys. And, you know, so they've got work in five or six hours, but they sit there and with the most mundane tools you could imagine, they manage to stick the car back together and get the power systems working. And at this point, it's about 3.30 in the morning. So we think we're in the clear, but we realize that'd be too easy for us. Um, then we realize that, one of the tires was being disagreeable and it had popped and we were trying to get another one on. Now, I know you probably think we're an incompetent racing car team um, when we can't put on our own tires, but uh, these are very disagreeable tires um, and we're also semi-incompetent. But eventually, you know, we ca you know, these people have been here till three in the morning. We had to send them home. We called up more people. We had other people coming in at four or five in the morning. We sat here for a few hours. I have a very painful memory of it um, with five or six people sitting around a rubber tire trying to put it on. And by 7 a.m. we got the tire on, and by 8 a.m. we were testing. Half the team was there doing the testing with us, and the other half were back at university falling asleep in the middle of lectures. And it once, once again was just such an eye-opener to me as to, to some of the, the real experiences that these students have got. You know, these are, these are not just classroom experiences. Um, they're things far beyond that. And the record attempt crept closer. Now, the record attempt isn't just a matter of driving a car in a circle for 500 kilometers. Um, it's actually taking 25 students, five cars, driving 1,000 kilometers to the bottom of the country in the cold, horrible winter. Um, is anyone here from Victoria? <laughs> All right, thank thankfully, it's a terrible place in winter. Um, you know, and then drive the car in circles for 500 kilometers on a track down there. And at this point, we were getting really nervous. You know, we, we'd spent so much time, you know, we're doing class, we're working all of this, trying to get it all together, so much sacrifice. And eventually, the record day crept closer. Um, I remember the day, it was the 23rd of July. It was the day where six months of hard work had gotten compressed into four single hours. And I'm sure a lot of you have had very similar experiences like that. And we're very lucky that we get to have these experiences here at such a young age. It was a 4 a.m. wake up, and by 6 a.m. we were on the track. We were completely inundated with fog, and before you know it, um, we're falling behind. We're 12 minutes from canceling. That's less than 1,000 seconds from having to get kicked off the track. But eventually, we managed to get the car on the, um, on the track, and we managed to start getting it moving. This is what it was like in the morning, um, just before canceling, and we were off. Hope it plays, if it doesn't play. I have to click. <laughs> media not found. That's terrifying. No. Is, the, is your video on here? Oh. Not yet, Sam? No. No, that's all right. Okay. I'm sorry. That's fine. <laughs> sorry, we've had worse problems with the solar car. <laughs> yep. So, what it came back to is that at the end of the day, I remember going home and I remember thinking, you know what, I wish everyone could experience something like this at universities across Australia. I wish everyone could experience the same thing I've experienced here at UNSW. You know, we all, we worked as hard as we could and we got to this end point. I wish everyone could experience what it's like to try and start a company here or to try and build a solar car. Or, you know, to try and take that car and inspire, you know, young women to take up engineering, you know, these really fulfilling things. So I guess the last thing I want to leave you all with is that what I've learned is that being part of the UNSW engineering experience is more than just you know, books and classrooms. It's really about you know, being a platform to tackle some of the most interesting work I think you could possibly do in your life. So thank you very much and have a good rest of the day. Thank you, Hayden. Um, I'd now like to welcome up uh, David Boothy, who has just entered stage right, um, to talk about the medical doctorate here at UNSW. Thank you, David. And uh, just so you know, I'm watching oh, your time. Gosh. Don't start, don't start, Jonathan. Um, 
Oh, well, hello, everybody. I really do enjoy uh, this day um, when everybody comes and we can showcase UNSW. Um, I think you're all so special that I've worn a tie today, so um, I don't usually wear ties. Um, so this is probably stuff that I've already spoken to you about before, but I'll just rehash it again for some people. Um, we offer a six-year undergraduate medicine program um, leading to the degrees of Bachelor of Medical Studies, Doctor of Medicine. Now, we changed from MBBS a couple of years ago, so we've had a smooth transition to the MD. We're the first uh, undergraduate medicine program to offer an MD. Um, it caused a little bit of confusion because an MD is usually a graduate uh, program. Uh, but it's been a smooth process, uh, which has been good. Um, an MD is a level nine qualification with the Australian Qualifications Framework, whereas an MBBS is a level seven. So we're very proud that we have been allowed to uh, have an MD. The core structure of the program remains exactly the same. Um, we do need to tweak the program um, to keep it relevant. What people learn in year one of any medical degree program is more than likely going to be obsolete within about five or six years. So we need to continually tweak the program to make it relevant. Uh, the structure of the program, uh, we work with graduate capabilities. It's, our program is a six-year outcome-based program. So we work with all these graduate capabilities. We have eight-week courses throughout the program and at the end of every course, students must meet all these graduate capabilities. At the end of each phase, we have three phases. At the end of each phase, they absolutely must meet these graduate capabilities. And at the end of the program, we graduate students that meet all these graduate capabilities. We go through domains, so we work on the life cycle. We go through, uh, in fact, the first the first um, eight weeks of the program is a foundation program where we teach our students uh, how to learn our program. It's very different from every other uh, medical school, it's very different from school, and it's very different from every other university program. So we need to teach them how to learn our program. So we go through the life cycle, foundations, and then we start with beginnings, growth and development, an eight week course, health maintenance, agings and endings. While our first year students are doing uh, the foundation program, the foundation course, we've got our second year students doing society and health. And then we combine years one and two together for a whole lot of things. And we do that for a purpose. We do that because we need to uh, teach our students how to uh, teach other people, be able to teach other people, and how our younger students uh, learn how to be taught from their peers. So we do it for a, a good reason. So the structure, back to the structure, 90% sciences in the first two years in phase one and 10% uh, clinical work. Uh, our students go to hospital in week seven of our program and then it gets more and more as, the, as time goes by. By, by phase two, we've got 50% um, science teaching and 50% clinical. So by, by year three, students are spending about three days in hospital and two days on campus. Year four, where we're quite different um, from other medical schools and why we're six years in length is our independent learning project. I'll talk more about that in a minute. But then they come back to year uh, to phase three and we join year five and six together again. A again, that's you know learning from your peers, teaching your peers, a major part of being a good doctor. Um, okay, the independent learning project, this is where we're very different from other medical schools. This is where we, um, we teach, what, read that, but it basically what we're doing is we're teaching our students good, solid research skills. We need to teach um, our students to be um, lifelong learners. Um, what's happening with this is, and we never meant it to happen, is we've got year four students who are now uh, publishing papers as a part of a research team um, and going overseas to conferences and presenting their papers as part of a research team. People um, think that Internship is going to be a big problem. I think the, the issue really is when these um, graduates, these junior doctors start applying for their specialty training where it's all very difficult. There are more, more people wanting to do more things than there are places available. For instance, surgery. A whole lot of people want to do surgery and they're never going to be able to do that specialty because there aren't enough places. 
With the independent learning project, what we're seeing is our graduates, when it's time to start applying for um, their specialty training, they can go, you know, you have to provide a CV now, there's interviews, there's a whole lot of stuff that you have to go through. So they can go and they can say, look, this is what I've done. I did this during my research year, tick. I, I presented this paper, I have published. So tick, 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 it really is a helpful way to get people into the specialty training that they're looking for. Um, this is one of my photos. I think I showed everybody my photos last year, but um, a whole lot of people want to know how we select people. Uh, we select people based on three selection criteria, academic merit, uh, UMAT for local students, and it's important to know if you've got any international students, it's ISAT, they sit ISAT. Uh, and an interview process. Um, this is where I do all the stats. Um, I know everybody likes a few stats. So we get three, th we're, still, we're still getting over 3,000 applications every year. This year we interviewed 427 students out of those 3,000 applications. The big question that everybody asks, and it's the most difficult question to answer, is what was the UMAT cutoff? And it is really difficult to answer that. Everybody knows that the lowest ATAR we look at is 96. The UMAT cutoff is determined, to get you to the interview stage, it's determined on the amount of applications we receive every year, the calibre of those applications we receive, and each individual's uh, ATAR. So it, it, it's determined on a whole lot of things. So it's really difficult to, to give a, a, an absolute answer to that. What I can tell you is the median ATAR of people that got in this year was 99.68. <laughs> um, the median UMAT of people that got in this year was 65.41. Having said that, uh, the lowest, uh, the person with the lowest ATAR that got in this year had a, an ATAR of 96.3 and a UMAT result of 69. So it is possible to get in with an ATAR of uh, 96. Um, obviously, that person that had 96.3 did an outstanding interview, but it really is possible. We th we're actually selecting the right people, we believe, based on these three selection criteria. Before we introduced these three selection criteria, it was based strictly on academic merit. So immediately people thought, OK, you know, I've got 99.95, I'll do law or medicine, without even thinking about the consequences of their career. Um, we are picking the right people. The, uh, those people that come to our program know our program now, know what to expect. So the attrition rate is quite, is, is, well, there's, it's very small. Uh, before, just, just a little bit of background, before when it was um, selecting people based on academic merit and the old program, we'd, we'd teach everybody all the sciences in the first three years, we'd throw everybody into hospital in year four, we'd have this big attrition rate because all these people that love the sciences thought, oh my goodness, I don't like blood, I don't like death, I don't like old people, I don't like the smell of hospitals, but people now know what to expect. Um, I think that's it. We, I'll tell you just a couple more things. We took in uh, 189 local and rural students. That's a combination this year. Um, there were 136 unbonded places offered and taken, 45 bonded, eight medical rural bonded scholarships, and this year we've taken in 80 internationals. Now, everybody, another question a lot of people ask is, how do we determine the bonded places? What we do is, once we've interviewed everybody and we've ranked everybody from the top down, uh, we just, we simply give the first uh, 136 people unbonded, regardless of whether they've said they're, they're willing to take a bonded place. Once we get below that line, we give the bonded places down, down the, um, the line to the people who have said, yes, we'll take a bonded place. So that's how we select our bonded students. Um, another big question is everybody is interested in our interview process. Now, most interviews now at medical schools are MMIs, mini, multi-mini something interviews. Uh, ours is a very, very straightforward interview uh, where we have two interviewers, a doctor and a community member. It's a life experience interview. It's all about what has brought you to this point in your life that you're wanting to do medicine. Now, when people complete uh, the uh, online faculty application, which is the first part of the application process, I want you to stress to your students, please, don't be precious about this application. Uh, too many people think that we're going to rank or score or mark that as part of the selection process. We don't really take that much notice of the application. What that application does, it's twofold. 
It puts the people um, that apply to us onto our database so we know they're interested in our program. And the most important thing is it starts students or starts the applicants thinking about why they actually want to do medicine because that's what our interview is all about. Okay, so when they come to an interview, I always tell people, look, it needs to come from here, not necessarily from here. Um, a whole lot of people uh, prepare furiously for this interview. And I've been interviewing since the beginning, when, since we started interviews in 2003. I can pick people that have been coached. I don't hold it against them, but it goes against themselves because they're telling us stuff from here, things that they think we want to hear. Uh, we want to hear stuff that's coming from here. We want to know why they're passionate about medicine. We want to know what's brought them to this point, what's happened in their life that they uh, actually want to do medicine. And we want to know that they understand what medicine's all about, that medicine is basically a 24-7 career. I always tell uh, students, you know, that ring up, or parents, basically, that ring up, you know, if you want your son or daughter or if you want to make a whole lot of money in a health profession and you don't want a 24-7 career, be a dentist. There's heaps of money in being a dentist. You're a dentist from 9 to 5, Monday to Friday, then you're your own person. Um, a doctor, it's a completely different kettle of fish altogether. Um, so it's a semi-structured interview. We ask the same uh, questions. Uh, in fact, the questions haven't changed over the years. Uh, they change slightly, but basically it's the same questioning uh, to get, to, get um, to, to an end product. Um, it takes about 40, 45 minutes, but really please stress to anybody that's going to come to an interview that it really, you know, it's all about your passion. Um, a, whole lot of people, a whole lot of people think they have to do um, uh, some sort of work experience. Now, one of the questions we do ask in uh, the interview is, have you done any work experience? Have you done any paid work? Now, some people, you know, a whole lot of people, one person might say to us, look, you know, my father is the top surgeon in New South Wales. I go and I watch um, surgery every week and blah, 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 blah. One person might say, look, I was so focused on getting the best ATAR I possibly could that I sold raffle tickets. Now, we're interested in both those answers, but we're interested in why you did it what you got out of it and how that helped you to think, you know, I actually want a profession that's going to be helping people. So sometimes these people here, um, you know, whose fathers or mothers are doctors, they think that they're going to get brownie points because they go, it doesn't work like that. We want to know your experience, you know, why it's happened for you. So I always tell people, just be honest, be yourself, 